The ISUPK under Commander General Yohanna will be hosting the Lord's 54th annual Passover in Raleigh, North Carolina at the Downtown Convention Center. This is something that you do not want to miss. Make sure that y'all bring the entire family. The downtown Raleigh Convention Center. For blacks, Hispanic, and Native Indians. Go to isupk.com to purchase your tickets today. 200 per every adult over the age of 17 years old. We are not the same. No, we not relate. No, we are not stuck on lit. Get this a vacation. I kept on the beat. You cannot debate. You just want the clap. The we Lord. just want the break. This is for annual pass. April the 1st. It's coming you down to run North Carolina. That's right. Commander General Yohan has done it again. You don't want to miss this. Pull your shot. Pull your shot.
Hey, Shalom, Israel. This is a public service announcement to all the sisters out there. Y'all already know what time it is. Them Passover corsages is blooming absolutely right this year. If you a married sister, rock that red corsage. And for all the single sisters out there, the white corsage was made just for you. Stop playing. You cannot be Passover ready without rocking one of these. Just $10 to complete that fit for the Lord's 54th annual Passover. Pre order yours now. Click the link below for more more info for just ten dollars i got a feeling that this is just the right batch of flowers to have you looking all point and official sisters make it your business to get you one we hope to see you there shalom is real she wanna roll, kick it around in my coop, me and you, we just cruising through the town lately. Every so question, girl, do you mind? What would it take to make you mine, please? Tell me be you and we can try. So I spit true, true, I take the whole thing. Take up my style, take up my style, I'm far from a land, girl, just let me put it. Oh yeah, it's going down. Join us for this year's All Black Party, hosted by Commanding General Yohanna and the ISUPK. This year, it's going down in Durham, North Carolina, at the Durham Armory. Last year, brothers and sisters came out from all over the world. It was a packed house to celebrate the 2000. And 22 Hebrew Academy graduate. These brothers faced life and death, and as a result, they were honored on this night for their sacrifice and their victory at the gauntlet. But wait, this year is going down. There will be a Hebrew concert featuring Captain Akai, 144 the Rebel, King Ty, Captain Ty War, Lost Tribe, Captain Katazai. I ain't sharp as I
Shalom. It's that time again, Israel. It's the Lord's 54th annual Passover in North Carolina. Y'all know what we do. Y'all know what we came to do. Huh? The ISUPK under Commander General Yohanna will be hosting the Lord's 54th annual Passover in Raleigh, North Carolina at the Downtown Convention Center. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. This is something that you do not want to miss. Make sure that y'all bring the entire family. The downtown Raleigh Convention Center. For blacks, Hispanic, and Native Indians. Go to isupk.com to purchase your tickets today. 200 per every adult over the age of 17 years old. We are not the same. No, we not relate. No, we are not stuck on lit. Death is a vacation. My camp undefeated. You cannot debate. You just want the clout. The Lord, the 54th annual pass April the 1st. It's coming down to Raleigh, North Carolina. That's right. Commander General Yohan has done it again. You don't want to miss this. Cool your thoughts. Cool your thoughts. Israel. This is a public service announcement to all the sisters out there. Y'all already know what time it is. Them Passover corsages is blooming absolutely right this year. If you a married sister, rock that red corsage. For all the single sisters out there, the white corsage was made just for you. Stop playing. You cannot be Passover ready without rocking one of these. Just $10 to complete that fit for the Lord's 54th annual Passover. Pre-order yours now. Click the link below for more info. For just $10, I got a feeling that this is just the right batch of flowers to have you looking on point and official. Sisters, make it your business to get you one. We hope to see you there. Shalom, Israel. Take my stuff, take my style, I'm far from a language, just want me put it down, baby. She on the road, can't get around in my coupe, me and you, we just cruising through the town lately. Every so question, girl, you 
or do you mind? What would it take to make you mine, please? Tell me be you and we can try. So I spit two, two, I did the whole thing. Take on my style, take on my style. I'm far from my language, just let me put it. Oh yeah, it's going down. Join us for this year's All Black Party, hosted by Commanding General Yohanna and the ISUPK. This year, it's going down in Durham, North Carolina at the Durham Armory. Last year, brothers and sisters came out from all over the world. It was a packed house to celebrate the 2000 and 22 Hebrew Academy graduate. These brothers faced life and death, and as a result, they were honored on this night for they sacrifice and they victory at the gauntlet. But wait, this year is going down. There will be a Hebrew concert featuring Captain Akai, 144 The Rebel, King Ty, Captain Ty War, Lost Tribes, Captain and the the I won your Allah. Also known as Dope. And Officer Natazar. UPK Natazar. And much more. It's going to be an open bar. Make sure that you get your tickets. It's going down this year. 2023. The 54th annual Passover and the annual All Black Party, hosted by Commander General Yohanna and ISUPK. I got a neighbor, and right. Tuss, tuss, tuss. Let's get a quick, you know what I'm saying? Quick mic check. Everybody, if you could. God. I think it's a while. If you could, make sure you um go to the um the America on Fire page on YouTube, Cross the Line Radio on YouTube, ITPK Durham on YouTube. Uh, share and subscribe to all those channels. And make sure you share this broadcast on all your uh, social media platforms as well. All right. We, we, we good to go? Come on, no sweat, no sweat. Come on, come on. You can remove that banner when you get a chance as well on the uh, stream yard. I think it's banners. I'm pretty sure it's banners. Yeah, go to banners and click it. Mm -hmm. That's where it is. It's definitely banners, not brand. Brand is like pictures and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
So we, we looking good? We two up? Come on, most high Christ, let's clap it up. Hey. Shalom, everybody. Yahweh about Shem and Hashem, rock a thumb uh, to the brothers. Yahweh Shem, all the thumb, Yahweh Shem, to the sisters. Of course, uh, welcome to the, uh, you know what I'm saying, ICPK lecture series. This is the um, lecture on the return to Black Wall Street, you know what I'm saying, brought to you by the ISUPK. A return to Black Wall Street will be a historical analysis of the rise and fall of one of the largest black business hubs in America. Uh, most importantly, with a final commentary on how to never lose it again. Uh, for anyone who's not aware, um, you know what I'm saying, where you are currently seated here uh, in this building at 2534 South Roxborough Street uh, in Durham, North Carolina, we are not even blocks away. We're in the midst of what was 100 years ago, maybe even less than 100 years ago, at one point considered the center of the black middle class. This neighborhood had national fame. You understand? Like, you know, to the degree of a, of a Los Angeles later on or New York City, you know, we've heard about these major cities, Atlanta. Well, there was a time when Durham, North Carolina, specifically what they called Negro Durham was comparable to, to major cities in terms of what it was, the, the progress that it was making, okay? And so uh, today's lecture is gonna be a, a kind of a journey through the history of not just this immediate area, but we're gonna talk about some different Black Wall Streets, but we're gonna hone in on Durham's Black Wall Street, which was known as the Haytai community. Uh, we're also going to talk about the Stagville Plantation, right? All of this leading up to the uh, Lord's 54th annual Passover, which is going down right here in uh, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, not too far from here. And so um, what we talk about today is going to lead up to those tours that we're going to be going on. So the things that we're going to be able to see when we do the Black Wall Street tour, when we do the Stagville tour, this is going to be a precursor to that, all right? And so, um, so again... Returning to Black Wall Street, brought to you by the ISUBK, uh, under commanding General Yohanna. And before I get into um, the actual, you know, uh, uh, the facts of the of the lecture, I did want to take uh, an opportunity to thank a few people, if I could, Baba Kusha Salakia. I got my thank yous written down. Bear with me. You know what I'm saying? Salakia, where we at? Uh, Lock you. Yeah. No sweat. I might just have to do it off top because I know my thank yous, but I had it written down all eloquently and everything, and now I can't. <laughs> I can't find it. But that's that's no sweat. That's no sweat at all. Oh, here we go right here. So let me let me first start out by saying, you know, what I'm saying, um, the water to all of you for for coming through, for supporting us for this lecture. You know, what I'm saying we really appreciate everybody that's here. You know, what I'm saying all my Adwanyam. My brothers, the sisters, of course, thank you. Say, give it up for the sisters for bringing food and different snacks and things like that. You know what I mean? We want y'all, of course, to enjoy yourselves while you, you know what I'm saying, hear us talk about these things and, and, and learn some of these new facts. If you, if you don't know already, a lot of brothers and sisters are up on these things. You know what I mean? But if not, you know what I mean? Let, let us, let's break some things down with you. Okay, so uh, I want to extend uh, my thawadas, which, of course, is thank you in ancient Hebrew. So the men above us, you know what I'm saying, all of my Adewanyam, you know what I mean? Because y'all y'all made this lecture uh, uh, possible in so many ways. First, to commanding General Yohanna. Got a shout out to commanding General Yohanna because he commissions every single thing that we do in this school. If commanding General Yohanna doesn't give it the go, it ain't going down. So we got a shout out to commanding General Yohanna for allowing us to do this lecture. You know what I'm saying? Also, um, the water to all the generals that aided uh, commanding General Yohanna in holding this truth down. We still have this truth 50 plus years later because Commander General Yohanna never dropped his sword and the men that was with him, that stuck with him, they stayed the course. So shout out to them generals as well. Um, also, let's say water to all the captains and all the officers that taught all of us every single thing that we know in this truth that we go to for guidance and everything that we do. Um, and I want to say a special water to Captain of 13,000 Naya Thak because he's the one that put the battery in our backs and selected me and, you know what I'm saying, my brothers and said, yo, y'all, Y'all can definitely do this, do this lecture. So, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so shout out to Captain Night, Dr. Water, sir. 
You know what I'm saying? If you don't know, he's over the entire state of North Carolina. So, you know what I mean? You got to know that. All right. But also, I want to also say a special thank you to Officer of a Thousand Iraq as well, because this lecture is his brainchild. And when I tell you this brother technically ain't from Durham, but you wouldn't know it. You would not know that he's not from here the way he, you know what I'm saying? He 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 puts this city on his back, you know what I'm saying, and, and pushes for things in this zone, you know what I mean? And so I gotta thank him for even putting us on the path to 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 do this lecture. All right. So to get the lecture started, you know what I'm saying? Let's begin with some facts. Let's start with some facts. Let me get the, get the next next slide. Well, first I want to start with a quote, right? If you could, yeah, just adjust that on the that laptop as well for the people to see as well. If you're not familiar with this uh, gentleman right here, this is Mr. Alan Locke. All right, Alan Locke is a very uh, prominent figure, especially within the um, the Harlem Renaissance. All right, I'm gonna read a little something uh, about Mr. Locke real quick. Uh, he was an educator, writer, and philosopher from Philadelphia. He was born into a prominent family descended from free blacks on both sides. Um, he was what one might call an academic Renaissance man, a true man of letters. He was a Harvard graduate, and he was a recipient of the famous Boydwin Prize. That same year in 1907, he became the first black Rhodes Scholar, a title that another black man, no other black man would become another Rhodes Scholar for 50 years. Um, he obtained his PhD in philosophy from Harvard in 1918, and he went on to teach at Howard University for 35 years. His philosophies on art, the great migration of Negroes from the South to the North, and what he called the new Negro, sat at the forefront of what was called, even then, the Harlem Renaissance. For his literary contributions that would come to be widely accepted as the movement's philosophical basis, he is known as the Dean of the Harlem Renaissance. His 1925 essay, The New Negro, is perhaps the most famous of those writings. And in it, he says this of the new Negro's, uh, the Negro's newfound mindset, all right? He said, with this new, renew this renewed self-respect, and self-dependence, the life of the Negro community is bound to enter a new dynamic phase. The buoyancy from within, compensating from, excuse me, compensating for whatever pressure there may have uh, of conditions from without. The migrant masses shifting from countryside to city hurdle several generations of experience at a leap. But more important, the same thing happens spiritually in the life attitudes and self-expression of the young Negro in his poetry, his art, his education, and his new outlook. With the additional advantage, of course, of the poise and greater certainty of knowing what it is all about, from this comes the promise and warrant of a new leadership, as one of them has discerningly put it. Now, this is actually him quoting Langston Hughes. We have tomorrow bright before us like a flame, yesterday a night gone thing, a sundown name, and down, and excuse me, and dawn today, broad arch above the road we came, we march. This is what even more than any most credible record of 50 years of freedom requires that the Negro of today be seen through other than the dusty spectacles of past controversy. The day of aunties, uncles, and mammies is equally gone. Uncle Tom and Sambo have passed on, and even the Colonel and George play barnstorm roles from which they escape with relief when the public spotlight is off. The popular melodrama has about played itself out and it is time to scrap the fictions, garret the bogeys, and settle down to a realistic facing of facts. The spirit of Mr. Locke's words describing a changing attitude among black people very much aligns with what would ultimately produce Black Wall Street. After slavery, there was a strong sense of urgency for the Negro to become a new version of himself, to evolve beyond the lowly state of slave and become the controller of his destiny. Ironically, Mr. Locke's vision was not quite the same as what would or better yet had already manifested it itself in many cities throughout the South and even Midwest as Black Wall Streets. His concern was less about Black enterprise and more about Black artistic expression. He was also a large proponent of the Great Migration, and he saw Southern cities as little novelties that couldn't provide to Negroes what larger Northern cities, and specifically Harlem, could. Of course, by this time in 1925, many black Wall Streets had already been destroyed or were on the decline. In one token, the new Negro mindset was a collective burst of energy with a common goal of racial pride, solidarity, and autonomy. But the truth is, 
that even the prominent, excuse me, even the most prominent intellectuals in the general post-slavery era could not agree on what was best for the Negro community. Booker T. Washington championed vocational training above all, even if it included working for white people. W.E.B. Du Bois believed strongly that higher education was the key to any form of black liberation, but he also sternly believed that we had to be incorporated into America's political fold. For all of the top brasses, collective education and well-written intellectualism, they could not pinpoint the simple reality that not only would create Black Wall Street, but ensure its permanent residency. However, the Bible describes that reality flawlessly, thousands of years before our captivity in America even began. Next slide, please. The book of Zephaniah, chapter 2 and verse 1. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Now a brief word on, on who we are, if you're not sure. I mean, most people in here know who we are. We're the ISUPK, right? Well, the ISUPK, the Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge, of course, was started in 1969 at 1 West 125th Street, Harlem, New York. And since that time, we've taught the truth according to the Bible, that the descendants of the Israelites, the biblical Jews, are known today as so-called blacks, Latinos, and uh, Native American Indians. The story of our school's origin figures prominently within the story that this lecture will expound on, specifically in a later section on the Great Migration. But um, truer words haven't been spoken. This right here is going to be the crux of this whole lecture. Everything that we read and everything that we talk about, we're going to find out that these words spoken, again, thousands of years before we even landed on this continent was the very thing that was missing from our struggle that would have made Black Wall Street never disappear in the first place. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna get into some facts too, so real, some real facts. First off, there's, no, there's really no such thing as a Black Wall Street. Uh, there's no street called Black Wall Street. It, it doesn't exist, all right? Black Wall Street is simply an epithet, a descriptive metaphor of post-slavery cities and towns with large black populations that were mostly independent in terms of their institutions. And they did that by comparing these uh, zones to the eight block long street in the financial district of lower Manhattan in New York City. Uh, the term Wall Street has become a metonym for the financial markets of the United States as a whole. Uh, this is important to note for several reasons. I'm gonna get the more cynical reason out of the way first. The obvious irony here is that Wall Street began its life as a financial district, as a slave market. Next slide, please. This is from the website Mapping the African American Past, which was produced by the Columbia Center for New Media Teaching and Learning in partnership with Columbia University's Teachers uh, College and uh, Creative cur Curriculum Initiatives. It says, often the slaves themselves were sent out to find work. In a time when fear of a slave uprising was ever present, the sight of so many enslaved men walking the streets looking to be hired caused alarm. Fearful white citizens began to complain. They demanded a market where slaves could be hired, bought and sold. Finally, on December 13th, 1711, the city council passed a law that all Negro and Indian slaves that are let out to hire, be hired at the market house at the Wall Street Slip. This market, known as the meal market, because grains were sold there, was located at the foot of, uh, of Wall Street on the East River. It was the city's first slave market. So to say Black Wall Street is already a misnomer because technically Wall Street was black when it started. But let's be honest, we understand that it wasn't black owned. That's a very common term today. You hear people talk about black owned, we gotta have things black owned, so on. But the term Black Wall Street didn't simply denote the amalgamation of a thriving black community and the existence of a black middle class. As Wall Street represents the financial and commercial flow for an area, excuse me, and commercial flow for an area to be deemed a Black Wall Street, or to get that moniker, 
it had to, on some level, demonstrate itself as a financial stronghold of black dollars. Next slide, please. Everyone's heard about this. This is the Greenwood District. The Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Let's talk a little bit about Tulsa. Of course, my brother's going to expound on it. But as has been cited many times, this is the perfect example. That's why this is the most famous of Black Wall Street. Because this is what they say about Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is the most famous of Black Wall Streets. They say that $1 in Greenwood, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, circulated 36 to 100 times and remained in Greenwood, in Greenwood almost a year for a leaving. That means Black dollars going to other Black people over and over again over and over again before somebody would say, well, let me go and, you know, spend it over here. But the dollars circulated in this community. You know, you look at this image and you might think to yourself, well, maybe this was a, you know, St. Louis or some, some city like that in the Midwest or up north of California some hundred years ago. No, this is black ran Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before we know what we know happened, all right? Let's get a little, little bit more on the, the financial health of that area. Uh, it was so strong. Check this out. The state of Oklahoma had two, um, had two, excuse me, state of Oklahoma had two airports, right? But there were six black families that owned their own airplanes in Tulsa. But Tulsa was uh, simply one of many such areas where successful blacks weren't simply concentrated residentially, but were all members of a symbiotic community that grew itself economically with little to no outside interference. Thusly, certain communities, and now I got to tell the, the bad part a little bit, certain communities, uh, while known for being thriving communities of black excellence, would just miss the mark for consideration as black Wall Streets. Uh, next slide, please. Harlem, New York. You know, I mean, that's where the ISUPK was born. You know what I mean? So Harlem is, of course, just, you know, again, prominent in so many ways. But I hate to I hate to be the bearer of bad news. You can't call Harlem a black Wall Street. And I'm going to explain why. OK, so lock you. Um, the reason why you can't call Harlem uh, a black Wall Street, even though it's without question, the most uh, recognizable example of a burgeoning black community post reconstruction, it was not a hub of black enterprise. As professor of 20th century uh, U.S. history at George Mason University, Dr. Stephen Robertson states in a piece on black businesses in 1920s Harlem, um, when blacks moved to Harlem to live, they also looked to relocate and establish businesses. While the number of Harlem's residences that were home to blacks steadily expanded, the neighborhood's businesses remained largely in white hands throughout the 20s. Thanks to the refusal of white banks to lend to blacks and white landlords to rent them space outside black neighborhoods, the scale and scope of black businesses remained limited, concentrated in the service sector and small in size. But many did resist, of course. Um, you know, many, 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 many tried to start their own businesses, right? So why, did, why didn't Harlem become a black Wall Street? That's important. That's important to this entire lecture. Why did Harlem, with all of these successful, enterprising, intelligent, educated, uh, 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 so-called black people willing to live amongst one another, why did it not become a black Wall Street? And this is the sad reality. Simply put, they didn't patronize their own businesses. This is a, a quote from uh, Dr. Stevenson as well, excuse me, Dr. Robertson. Um, more often than not, however, residents chose to walk right on by black businesses and into the stores of their white competitors. They would not support the race at the expense of their ability to consume equally as Americans. Alongside all that happened in Harlem to give blacks a new consciousness of what they could achieve, shopping offered a contrary picture of limits that remain. Doesn't that sound also oh familiar? Isn't that the same thing that happens nowadays where people talk about we got to do black business and we got to start black businesses. But then the minute the black business opened, they got so many complaints. Well, the same thing was happening in Harlem. How are they going to get the resources that white businesses literally blocks away from Wall Street were going to have? It's impossible. 
And so it, it was held against them. And a lot of times they just weren't uh, patronized. And this highlights a distinct beauty about the true black Wall Streets that sits at the forefront of what even sparked the idea for this lecture. And this is the beauty of it. There was a time and apparently specific places where our ancestors had to rely on each other. Next slide, please. This right here is the corner of Parrish Street and Corcoran in downtown, what we call now downtown Durham. There is no oppressors in this image. Look at that car. That's what my brother pointed out to me when I saw this image. I was like, I looked, I didn't even notice it. He said, look at that car. That car is almost certainly owned by a brother. You know what's right on this side of the street? You can't see it in this photo. But the famous Durham Bull is right here. Or it will be there later. What we now call downtown Durham, with all of the new high rises they're building and the, the gentrification as they call it, 100 years ago, we owned it. Okay? Salakia. Let me, let me read on. Black Wall Street uh, was a child of necessity for a people reeling from the scars of chattel slavery and finding out the ever so elusive truth that so many black and brown folks know but all too often forget. We all we got. So in a somewhat strange twist of fate, there'd be no quote-unquote black Wall Street without the financial element, right, of the black-owned institutions. But these things are meaningless without the dedication of the people to those institutions. As Jim Harper, a brother, and the chair and professor of history at North Carolina Central University says, most people, when they talk about Durham's Black Wall Street, they only talk about the financial district, the businesses. But it was also what we call the Haytai community. It was literally a community that helped the business sector to thrive and survive. And so as we will see, the community of Haytai was essentially the residential section of a prosperous, Black-owned and operated financial sector. It's because of this that Negro Durham actually lasted much longer than many other well-known black communities. Next slide, please. See if you can just uh, play this video. There's sound to this, but you don't, I hope it actually doesn't play the sound. Let's see. Oh, well, actually, that's cool. No sweat, you gotta worry about the sound. This is actually footage from a film that was released in 1948 called Negro Durham Marches On by Don Parisher. The film was commissioned by the Durham Business and Professional Chain, the DBPC, Durham's oldest African-American business advocacy organization. These are all black students in front of Hillside High School, which we visited with Commanding General Johanna. This was the first black high school in the Piedmont region of North Carolina. And it sat for a long time. Yeah, that's totally fine, yeah. We don't even need to sat, right? And so what you're seeing here again, you're seeing these, 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 these so-called uh, Negro children coming out of high school. This was our school. This was not incorporated at all into the North Carolina education system. They had nothing to do with it. It was our school. All of these businesses uh, that you're going to see, that these brothers are, are, are going to talk about, uh, uh, Officer Bunky all is going to discuss, right? DeShazor's cosmetic uh, uh, um, beauty shop. It was also a cosmetic school and a barber shop and a barber school. And it was ours. All right? Salakia. Look at that. Yeah, this is this is this is sisters again. This is 1948. This is sisters within DeShazor's beauty school. This was also on Paris Street. Okay. You can actually go see this film. You can go watch this film. It's on YouTube. It's not uh too difficult to find. All right. Where they highlight um, you know, a lot of the again prominent businesses at the time. And this is not even in the height of Black Wall Street in Durham, which was probably more into the 20s and the 30s, right? This is when it was after this time that things started to be on the decline, but that's you know neither here nor there. But you can see a visual of what's actually what's happening at that time. Next slide, please. Let's click it again. Here we go. So going back to the idea of what a Black Wall Street is, there were other ones. Very other other 
big black Wall Streets, very you know prominent uh, places. You had Jackson Ward in Richmond, Virginia, Second Street, right? That's a black owned bank. That's another um, feature that al almost always plays into this. Whenever there's a black owned bank, more than likely it was a black Wall Street. There, if I'm not mistaken, there were no black owned banks in Harlem. And if there were, they certainly, again, were not being patronized to the level of the near white banks. You had Bronzeville in Chicago. It was called the Black Metropolis. You had Ninth Street in Little Rock, Arkansas, Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia, and Ferris Street in Jackson, Mississippi. Again, it was a lot easier to, to um, cultivate black business in these southern areas where what was happening. This is after Reconstruction. Segregation was, was so strong in these areas. Again, it was just a necessity for black people to literally gather together. All right? So lock you. So what happened to Black Wall Street? Next slide. This is what happened to Black Wall Street. All right. Tulsa, Oklahoma was put to an end on June 1st, 1921. Like I said, Black Wall Street in Durham lasted a little bit longer. After one, uh, an armed white mob descended on the Greenwood District, the black residences, residents, excuse me, and businesses in the neighborhood were attacked leaving 35 city blocks, quote unquote, in charred ruins, according to the Tulsa Historical Society. As many as 300 people, mostly black, were killed and hundreds more were injured, while thousands of Tulsa's black residents lost their homes and businesses. Um, Durham's Black Wall Street suffered a different fate. Uh, in lieu of bombs and heavy ammunition, it was the ambitions of a political machine hell-bent on making room for the suburban aspirations of white GIs coming home from the war. The whole point was to reward them with exclusivity. That's why you see so many subdivisions here and so many gated communities. These things were built after World War II. World War II, after these, these uh, Caucasian GIs came home, they were promised land, they were promised low-interest loans, and the only thing that they demanded was that you don't put them too close uh, to black people. That was the whole point, to, 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 to make sure that they had the gated community lifestyle and that they were uh, insulated from us. In fact, if I could, Salakia, Nigo, I'm going to read just a little piece here. This is from a book called The, uh, the Embrace of Buildings. This is more of a, a, um, a book on urbanism, right? This is page four. Oh, and this book is by Lee Hardy. It says, in its appraisal system for determining housing value, the FHA, that is the Federal Housing Authority, downgraded the traditional urban neighborhoods that were old, dense, and contained non-residential elements such as offices and retail establishments, meaning they were mixed use, right? Which is what, to some degree, Haiti was, because Many brothers and sisters walked to work in the Haiti community. That's mostly how they got to work. That this time in the in the twenties and thirties, you know, cars were not readily available to everybody, and most people had to either what take a streetcar or or some other means of transportation, right? So these neighborhoods were very dense. It says um, it also downgraded neighborhoods harboring. Listen to this inharmonious racial or nationality groups. You imagine what that means. Until 1948, its underwriting manual advocated the use of restrictive covenants written into property deeds, prohibiting the sale of homes in predominantly white neighborhoods to black families. The real estate industry pitched in as well. The 1924 Code of Ethics for the National Association of Real Estate Boards stated that, this is a quote from their actual charter, a, real, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing to a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individual whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in a neighborhood. So, of course, we can imagine who the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, was talking about when they said that. It was fancy ways of saying, don't put them too close to black people. 
In fact, there was other parts of their charters where they said that if you are close to black people, you have to have some kind of natural barrier or some kind of uh, artificial barrier between the neighborhoods. There's even a story about uh, one realtor who had built a subdivision, but it was too close to a black neighborhood. So you know what he did? He built a wall, six feet high, about two feet thick, between the neighborhoods. The next day, the Federal Housing Authority approved his request. That wall still exists today in Detroit, Michigan, at the end of Eight Mile Road. Next slide, please. So this lecture is going to begin with slavery. I'm just prepping everybody, right? And there's a reason why we're um, starting with slavery, right? For one, chronologically, slavery is the backdrop for, um, by which any and all black Wall Streets are connected. The residents of these communities more often than not had some connection to the vast plantations uh, throughout the southern United States. This photo actually freaks me out because this is an actual photo of slaves. I know that sounds strange, but and it's probably a lot, but these are they someone took a camera to a field and photographed actual slaves and an overseer in the middle of their work. Next slide, please. Another connection. How can we talk about Haiti but not talk about where it gets its name from? Haiti comes from Haiti or IT, where what happened? What happened in Haiti was what? The most successful slave revolt in history. All right, it was a direct correlation to the slave rebellion there that began on the 22nd of August, 1791. And it ended in 1804 with the former colony's independence. It's the only time that slaves revolted and the colony became actually independent. Next slide, please. So that spirit of independence is why it was named Haiti. All right. Of course, Toussaint L'Overture, who was the considered the general, right, who really uh, uh, spearheaded the um, the uh, 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 revolution in Haiti. What about Mr. Nat Turner, who had an unsuccessful but albeit infamous slave revolt in Virginia, and Denmark Vesey, who did the same thing. So Black Wall Street in Durham started with the spirit of independence that was prominent in what they were attempting to create, okay? So it wasn't by accident. Next slide, please. And last but not least, well, actually this is not last, but another reason to start with slavery is the simple danger of being a black man in Reconstruction. Um, here we have an actual news clipping from a lynching that took place in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Roseville, right outside of Raleigh. Around that same time, this book was published, The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. Who's ever heard of the movie um, Birth of a Nation? You've heard of Birth of a Nation. But you might have heard of, I mean, many people know that the one that uh, the brother did, you might remember his name? Nate Parker's water brother. Nate Parker's version of um, a, a Birth of a Nation was to, to call to mind the original Birth of a Nation film that came out, I think, in either 1912, between 1912 and 1915. Well, that original film was not an original, original piece. It was not an original screenplay. It was based on a book. This book, The Klansman by Thomas Dixon Jr., who himself was from North Carolina. Here we have photos of Ku Klux Klan costumes at the turn of the century in North Carolina, right? And then, of course, we know the many lynchings that took place all throughout the American, all throughout the American South, right? Next slide, please. So Black Wall Street, again, being about necessity, we had to gather together. We had to be close to one another, if for nothing else, just to be safe. And now, last but not least, um, the current climate of today. Salakia. Our current, current climate is a fertile uh, ground for a discussion of these sorts. Uh, the other per pervasive question of what will it take for our people to gain freedom is still being asked. It's as if 100 years of fighting, whether it be political or physical, has not moved the goalpost nor resulted in a cultural first down. Instead, 
brutality against so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native American Indians is on the rise. Political pundits and podcasters alike find ways to justify our suffering in coded terms like anti-woke, while accusing detractors of America's prejudices of being race baiters. All right? I want to get a quick quote from another person. Here's what he just said. Yeah, I just want to uh, quote this small, small part from this book. This is a book that Mark Lamont Hill has released called Nobody, right? Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable. Right? This is after uh, the events in Ferguson, all right? Bear with me just a moment. Here we go. It says, it would be easy, given the logic of the current moment, to individualize this crisis. We could say that our problems are the work of a few bad apples and that the great majority of police, prosecutors, politicians, corporations, indeed the great majority of the nation fr frowns on the exploitation of the vulnerable, right? Regardless of our individual or collective intentions, we are nonetheless bound up in a state of emergency in this nation. In order to repair the damage that has been done, we must craft a new set of frameworks for our economy, for our schools, for our justice system, for public housing. We must resist the power and persuasion of market values. We must reinvest in communities. We must imagine the world that is not yet. And this rings true for all Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians um, living in this world. Tyree Nichols, murdered by five of his own people. George Floyd, murdered by, uh, what's his name, Derek Chauvin? Derek Chauvin. Right? Of course, we know about little Trayvon Martin, who died mercilessly, mercilessly, similar to Emmett Till. We know about the police units, the gang units. We know about babies locked up in cages. And of course, we, how could we forget about the black-on-black the -black crime they remind us of, of so much? But these are the things that we, we deal with in this place. And so now it's time to, to kind of look backward so we can look forward, OK? Uh, just a little bit more here, Salakia. Um, so today's lecture. Um, you know, it's a journey through a history that most of us, if not fully informed, have some awareness of. Um, it seems so long ago, but it's not. All right. The, the remnants of Durham's Black Wall Street are still here. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, we'll be able to see how um, if, if we had the right tools, if we had used the appropriate tools, if we had known the right tools, there'd be no George Floyd. There'd be no Tyree Nichols. There'd be no Emmett Till, Trayvon Martin. There'd be no none of our babies in cages. We'd police our own streets. We'd have our own first responders, and we wouldn't kill each other the way we do. So again, so again, I hope everybody uh, in, enjoys the lecture. We're probably going to do questions at the end if anybody has any. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to bring up the next uh, uh, speaker who's going to expound on the history of slavery in this state specifically. Uh, I give you Officer 500 Yanazar. Yahweh Baha Shem, Yahweh Shai, Barakatham to all the brothers, Yahweh Shema, Alatham Baha Shem, Yahweh Shai to all the sisters. And of course, I want to give big up to Commander General Mahan. Uh, General Yahana and the generals, you understand, for upholding this truth. And I want to give credit to my captain, you know what I'm saying, for, for you know, really guiding us through this whole process. And I want to mention, real quickly, I want to mention Officer Iraq, Officer 1000 Iraq, because when he called me up, when Iraq calls you, you know something has to be done. When he called, you know, it's some work to be done when he called, you know. But he called me and he gave me this assignment, you know, and I was so happy, I was so proud that I had the opportunity to make this kind of contribution, you know what I'm saying? So so I dug in, you know what I'm saying? And we, myself and the, and the brothers here, we did a lot of research. I mean, I actually have like a whole stack of research you know, that we had to condense it into what we're about to present to you today. And so in order for us to understand, so like in order for us to understand where we come from and how we got to this condition, of course, we have the scriptures, of course, first of all, but also we have recent history you understand that tells us exactly how we got here. And it all started with slavery. 
then and then at the same time, we got to remember one thing. The so-called Hispanic tribes and the Native Indian tribes went into slavery first. You understand? They were exported to England and to Spain and to other European nations before the transatlantic slave trade picked up. So we got to remember that always. You understand? Because what happened to one tribe happened to all the tribes. It ain't no separation or no distinction. All right, so slavery, we all know what slavery is, right? Everybody knows what slavery is. The institution of slavery in America and the Western Hemisphere hemisphere was and is the ultimate form of oppression. The devastation and destruction related to the cruel inhuman industry can hardly be measured and certainly not quantified in its total negative effect on its victims, the so-called Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians. Even the immense wealth gained by the slave master and other oppressors cannot justify the horrific psychological and cultural damage done to the so-called Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians. All three groups suffered tremendously in the oppressor's wicked conquest of the Western Hemisphere. The basis of this conquest was slavery, rape, robbery, and murder, genocide, psychological decimation, and greed. That is how America was built, and that is also how America thrives until this day. So-called blacks were viewed as chattel, just a notch above being an animal. So-called Native Indians were forcibly removed from their lands or exterminated, as some tribes were, to make room for plantations and other industry. The so-called Hispanic people suffered the same fate being enslaved, murdered, and all their lands confiscated by Spanish-speaking oppressors. Same people, different language. Block it. So-called blacks made up the vast majority of slave labor, of the slave labor force. They were also, also forcibly removed from what was considered their homeland and systematically robbed of their culture and identity. And with that, I'm going to read a scripture. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17 and verse 4. And it reads, And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. You understand? So in slavery, it was a practice in slavery to disrupt any kind of cultural... Con uh, con oh, boy, I can't get the word out of my mouth contingency, like any kind of, you know, positive cultural contingency, they would try to destroy it. You understand? Even until this day, we see that happening until this day. So we would discontinue from our heritage that I gave thee. You understand? We're the only people on the planet Earth that the Most High gave us a culture, a heritage. All the other nations, they made it up. You understand? But we're the ones, you understand, that was given it directly from the Most High. And I say that so that we can understand how valuable it is and why we must return. And that's basically what returning to Black Wall Street is about. It's about us returning to being sufficient, self-sufficient in righteousness. You understand? Okay, so let me finish this scripture if I could. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies. We all serve in our enemies, man all of us, in a land which thou knowest not. When they took the native Indians and the Hispanics to Spain and to England, they didn't know those lands. And when they brought us over here, we didn't know these lands. You understand? So we are in this together. I just want to emphasize that. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. I mean, you know, if we, you know, if we read the scriptures, you know what we've done against the Most High. We all know that, and we're lucky to be alive in actuality. So let's get back to the lecture. While so-called blacks made up the vast majority, okay, I read that, slavery as a whole was heaven for the slave master. He or she was enriched on the level of European lords and aristocrats. In North Carolina, where we will focus on much of this lecture, you can trace a good portion of many major institutions origins to the slave trade and plantation profits, including Duke University and the University of North Carolina. 
Slavery in North Carolina was widespread, but predominantly in the central and eastern parts of the state, primarily because of the land usage, as these region, regions were more conducive to agriculture. Slavery was legal in North Carolina from 1705 until January 8, uh, 1863, when President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Prior to statehood in the province of North Carolina, as of the year 1767, there were 41,000 slaves in the province. North Carolina became a state on November 21st, 1789. And by 1860, there was 31, there was 33, no, so lucky, 331,059 slaves recorded in North Carolina. 1860. About one third of the total population of the state were slaves. There were 19 counties where the slaves outnumbered the free whites during the antebellum period, which simply means prior to the war. That's all that means. It's a big word. It just means before the war. Okay. Which simply means, okay, that's what I just said. Okay. The state of North Carolina passed several laws to protect slave owners way of life. These laws were designed to disenfranchise the slaves, putting them totally at the mercy of the oppressor. To disenfranchise a people is to deny them access to legal recourse. You understand? And therefore, you cannot profit from your own culture, your own production. You understand? Whatever you produce. And with that, I'm going to give you another scripture. This is the book of Salakia. phone is acting up. Bear with me, please. This is the book of Micah, chapter 2 and verse 2. And it reads like this. Excuse me, my phone is kind of acting up. I get it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, here we go. This is the book of Micah, chapter 2 and verse 2. And they covet fields, you see? Fields because they know that's where the wealth is. They took all the land. They took every inch of land in the Western Hemisphere. Every inch they took. Every inch. They covered fields, and they take them by violence and houses and they take them away so that they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. You understand? That's why, even until this day, let's look at hip hop. You know we created hip hop, right? Everything we create, they take it. That's oppression. You understand? You cannot, like, okay, we get a few millionaires out of hip hop, but in reality, it's the white man or the salaki or the oppressor who gets the real money from the deal. That's oppressing them. That's just an example of how you would oppress a culture. You understand? So our culture has been oppressed through slavery. As I said before, slavery is the ultimate form of oppression. You can't get more oppressed than slavery. And quiet is kept. We still in slavery until this day. You understand? The slave owners were in constant fear of slave revolts. And it took many measures to protect the cash cow, which was the institution of slavery. Despite their circumstances, many slaves distinguished themselves as artisans, soldiers, writers, and religious leaders because of the geography of North Carolina, of Slakia. Because of the geography of North Carolina, the initial trade in slaves was limited. The string of islands, now this is talking about the outside of North Carolina, where they have all these islands, so they couldn't bring in slaves except for in Wilmington. So that most of the slaves was brought into Virginia and South Carolina because they didn't want to deal with the issues on the shore of North Carolina, okay? Um, most cargo ships chose ports to the north and to the south of North Carolina. The one major exception was Wilmington. Wilmington became a major port due to its accessibility and by the 1800s, black people in Wilmington outnumbered whites two to one. 
Wilmington benefited greatly due to the skilled trade of black people like carpentry, masonry, and other construction-related skills, as well as boating skills and sailing, helped Wilmington to grow into a very influential city. As the plantation system began to expand throughout the Lower South, many slaves in Salakia enslaved blacks were sold south out of North Carolina to work on these ever-growing larger plantation systems. By 1767, there were 40,000 slaves in the state about 90% of them were field workers who performed agriculture work. The remaining 10% were domestic works workers or house triggers, of which came the more skilled workers such as artisans, butchers, carpenters, and tanners. Uh, a, a tanner is just somebody that makes products out of animal skins. So he would make leather and other goods from the animal skins. Okay, that's a tanner if anybody didn't know. After the Revolutionary War in, in 1790, okay, during the Revolutionary War, America did not import any slaves for about 10 years because they were, the British had a greater navy and they had basically blockaded, you know, the import of slavery because that was the wealth of America, okay? But in 1790, it resumed. A very number of lock here. The slave, okay, was lifted by 18, oh, so lucky. 10 years later, over 140,000 blacks were living in North Carolina. A very small number of these were free blacks. We must remember that while slavery was growing rapidly, the southern and eastern tribes of the native Indians are being decimated through war and famine. So at the same time, slavery is expanding. They're taking the, the native Indian, the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Reuben, and moving them off their land. You understand? So there's a correlation there. You understand that they never talk about in the history class as well. Um, as the oppressor sets his sights on Mexico and the lands to the west, you understand, because they're doing it while, listen, while they were fighting the Civil War, which we'll get into later, they had already mapped out the lands that they wanted to steal. You understand? They had sent explorers out there, Pocahontas, was it Pocahontas? And um, Lewis and Clark and them, they went out there and they mapped out these lands and the oppressor wanted these lands and they claimed these lands before they even had acquired them through theft and war. Okay. Uh, as the population grows, livestock farming becomes more profitable, so an increasing number of blacks are bonded to farming-related labor. The era after the American Revolution led to an increased oppressive, uh, to increased oppressive regulation throughout what is known as the Black Codes. The Black Codes were designed to limit black rights and to tighten the reins of disenfranchisement. Slaves were not allowed to travel without a pass, could not, could not testify against whites, could not gamble or raise livestock, could not own a gun or a weapon or even hunt, nor could they read nor write. If a black man was accused of rape, of raping a white woman, he was lynched and sometimes burned alive after a, bu a brutal beating without a trial or even a hearing. Punishment for disobedience and other perceived offenses varied. Whippings and other acts of cruelty were common. The majority of slaves in North Carolina were farm laborers who worked six days a week, sun up to sun down. The, the, and the children of Salakia, the children and the elderly often worked in vegetable gardens and took care of livestock. I'm going to offer another scripture at this time. It's uh, Exodus uh, 1 and 13, Salakia. Because the scripture says that we were going to Egypt again with ships. You understand? Meaning that the thing that we're dealing with here in America is the same thing that our brothers, our forefathers dealt with in Egypt. And it reads, this is the book of the book of Exodus, chapter 1 and verse 13. And the Egyptians 
made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. You understand? That word always stuck with me because I understood exactly what it meant. I mean, they worked you to death, man. They literally worked some of our people to death, literally. So that's the rigor that was used, you understand, to extract wealth from our labor by the so-called oppressor. Everything that we've done and everything that we've experienced here in America is biblical. You understand? Because we are the people of the book, of course. That's why. Okay. So now they would take the children and the older people and they would work like they would have a little vegetable garden over here or something there, and they would have them work. Meaning that everybody, they got some work out of it. They didn't care, like when the scripture says that they don't care for the old or the young. You understand? They didn't care how old you were. Uh, between, check this out, between 1810 and 1860, 140,000 enslaved blacks were sold out of North Carolina. So now they got so many slaves, they're able to sl sell slaves to other states. And 140,000, the average, well, I'll get into that later, the average black slave sold for $200. And if you, if you multiply that, that's $28 million they made selling those 140,000 black. Now, that might seem like, it might not seem like a lot of money today, but man, back then you could buy a country with 28 million. Okay, so the common crops, crops included corn, cotton, of course, tobacco. In this region right here, Raleigh Durham was big in tobacco. The majority of slaves lived in huts or log, ca or log cabins referred to as slave quarters built by the slaves themselves. Enslaved people were usually given three to five pounds of salt pork or smoked pork along with cornmeal as their rations. Some slaves were given ample rations, while others were given barely enough to survive. It depended on who your slave master was. Some slave masters was more generous than others, if you could call it that. Slaves typically received two sets of clothing per year. During the summer, the clothes were made of cheap cotton. Winter clothing, were made of linsey woolsey cloth. I don't know. I I seen that cloth before. When we was kids, they used to. It was the cloth that used to put stuff inside of coats. Now you know I'm telling my age. That was way back. That was back. <laughs> way way back. You know, they, don't, they don't do that no more. But that's what they. You know. But check this out. Check this out. Uh, the children's clothes were made of flour or gunny sacks. You ever see the little rascals and they had a character in there, Buckwheat? And he used to have a little sack on for his clothing. That's what... <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna read that again. The children's clothes were made of flower sacks or gunny sacks. Clo clothing, and check this out, was commonly given out during Christmas holiday. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Oh, Salakia. Oh, oh my goodness. The water, brother. This map right here, during the research, I came across this map. And I'm going to tell you, this map is very significant, and I'm going to explain it to you. The darker areas of the map are the higher concentrations of slavery and, and plantation. Now, you see here, you see the Mississippi Valley right here, right? But what it shows, okay, when you see the ISUPK on the corners, talking about we built this country, it's not just the physical labor, I'm gonna show you. Wherever you see these dark black areas, you'll find a major city. Here you'll find Houston, Galveston, and Corpus Christi. Here you'll find Memphis, Tennessee, and all the major cities that run along the Mississippi Valley from New Orleans all the way up to St. Louis. All of these places, look at this, I didn't even know that it was so much slavery going on here, but you got to imagine the Mississippi River, this is where they're exporting all the goods. They're putting them on the river and sending them down river or up river. You understand? So it, it, it makes sense that the Mississippi River Valley was full of slaves. You understand? Over here, we got, um, what is it? Um, 
Savannah, Georgia. We got Raleigh, Durham here. We got Atlanta. You understand what I'm saying? All the major cities were built. The, the, like, look down here. I'm going to show you this, too. This white area right here, that means there was no slavery there. That's because the Seminole Indians and the freed blacks who had escaped slavery prevented slavery during this period. So you had, look at this, all the way up to Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. You understand? They're getting rich, man. I mean, they're getting rich off of black people. You understand? Slavery built every major city in America, including New York. You understand? Because there were two, as the brother mentioned, there was two slave markets in New York City, Wall Street, and there was another one up in Harlem on 124th Street. Okay. So this is all the wealth that they extracted from the southern states. You understand? Which later on became part of what we call the Industrial Revolution. That's where they sent the money. Okay. Social and leisure time played a significant role in slave life. Holidays, religion and family life, and music provided an escape. Sound familiar? Ain't nothing changed that much, y'all. Understand? This, this, this is 150 years ago, 200 years ago. And it's still the same today. The harsh reality of of slavers, of slavery, Salaki, of slavery. One man, his name was Charlie Barbour. He was, this is from a slave narrative, he says, as he recalled New Year's festivities. Quote, on the night before the first day of January, we had a dance what last all night. And at midnight, the master makes us a speech, and we is happy that we is good. That's what he says. And then he says, and he says about Christmas, Christmas was the most important holiday in the social calendar. At Christmas, we had a big dinner, and we was happy. Because the plantations in North Carolina were generally smaller, and the social dynamic somewhat different, as in other states, because of what I mentioned earlier about the, um, the geography of the coast of North Carolina, North Carolina was slow in the slave market, but trust and believe they caught up. You understand? Uh, we had a bit, okay, okay, I read that, dynamics, okay. In other states, the hierarchy of slaves, of enslaved domestic workers and field workers was not as developed as other states. There were fewer number of slaves to specialize in each job. Thus, on smaller farms, enslaved people may have been required to work both the field and in other varieties of jobs at different times of the year. So this is also how we became to have a lot of multiple types of skills because we were doing so much. We came over here with skills anyway. You understand? We were craftsmen and all of that before they brought us over here and they knew it. But also now we're doing different jobs, a lot of different jobs, okay. Okay. Uh, due to the harsh wickedness of slavery and the immoral, merciless oppression of chattel slavery exhibited by the slave master, slave revolts were common. And in 1829, David Walker, a free black from Wilmington, North Carolina, published David Walker's Appeal, an anti-slavery book that helped blow the covers off slavery as a moral institution, as the hypocritical society tried to portray it as. Meaning like, the oppressor tried to make the world think that like, they was doing us a favor. They tried to make it seem like slavery was something that was good for the world only good for his pocket. You understand? Uh, in the book, slavery is condemned and, is, and called for the abolition or the abolishment of slavery. So this is a problem now. This is now, you know, black people are, making, are publishing anti-slavery literature. And you know, this is causing a problem. And this has also contributed to what led up to be the Civil War as well. 
Then, in 1831 in Virginia, the Nat Turner Rebellion occurred. The most famous of several rebellions or uprising in, ne in nearby states, Nat Turner led the rebellion of 75 escaped blacks who, led by Matt Turner, killed a group of about 60 white enslavers and their sympathizers. Can we get a hand for Nat Turner right quick? You know, I love that. I love to read. Can I read it again? <laughs> you know, Nat Turner and his group killed 60 enslavers and their supporters. You know? And that's significant because Nat Turner, even though his uh, rebellion failed, he understood what needed to be done at that particular time. Now, we don't call for violence against anyone, but we sure do understand. Okay. Uh, okay. So the uh, the oppressor became more, okay. Where am I? Fear for you. Okay, here it is. These events, along with others, called the whole slavery industry and its sympathizers to become more fearful and even more protective of the institution of slavery. And from 1830 on, passed a series of laws they hoped would prevent such uprisings in the future. Disobedience was a constant was a distant second in the mind of the slave master as compared to a runaway. An escaped or, ens or enslaved brother or sister was the main concern. The slave master hated this more than anything. He was, not only did he hate it because of the financial loss, but it was an embarrassment to him for a slave to escape. You know, his, he wasn't holding the reins tight enough. You understand? The economic loss and the humili humiliation of the occurrence was to be avoided. Thus, stricter punishment was in order. So more laws were made to protect the oppressor. Reward for the capture and returning of slaves increased. If a slave escaped, his master would give the best possible description physically, his dress and his character or personality of the slave was included in the description. The award amounts were increased from 25 cents to up to $500. Now it depend on the slave, cause some, the average slave was returned, the reward was like $10, that's the average. But if you had a slave who had a particular skill or a particular valuable value to the slave master, they would pay up to $500 for his return understand so you can imagine how much money you understand so if michael jordan made 10 million <laughs> if slave master made 100 you understand that's that's what that's mean that's what that means lock you um the slave master would often times take out ads in newspapers adding to the economic imp impact which affected every aspect of each region's economy the majority of slaves that escaped were males. Females were less likely to escape. <laughs> Slavery was very difficult for the men, but the women were violated in more ways than the men. Although male slaves at time were raped or sexually abused, it was far more common, even regular among the sisters. Perhaps the most famous slave to escape from North Carolina was a sister named Harriet Jacobs. Jacob is the author of a book, The Life of a Slave Girl, that was published in 1861. Jacobs famously lived underneath her mother's crawl space for seven years before escaping to Philadelphia. This sister, they thought she had ran off the plantation, but she was actually living under her mother's house for seven years. For seven years. And she finally escaped to Philadelphia. And she told the story. In her writings, she alluded to the high number of sexual assaults and abuses suffered by the women as some were forced into prostitution. The sex trade was another byproduct, you understand, of the criminal enterprise called slavery. It's unknown how many slaves 
escape and were returned due to their owner's uh, advertisement. But many details about slave life and was provided by the records, you understand, of them taking out these ads. Because they would give out uh, different perspectives in the, in, of the various slave owners. They provided documentation of the vast, of the various stages in the evolution of the institu institution of slavery in America. These are some of the best records that we have of slavery, is the, was these uh, advertisements that they took out to, to return st stolen sla or escaped slave. The history of slavery in North Carolina developed a little later than its neighboring states. The development and the growth of the plantation life came at the expense of not only blacks, but also of the native Indian. The native Indian was devastated as many were relocated or exterminated in the, la in the massive land grab necessary to expand slavery and the empire. Trail of Tears. I have to mention this because this is a byproduct of slavery. And blacks and Native Americans and, and, and so-called Hispanics, we all suffered during this. At the beginning of the 1830s, you know, you see this is the same time that there's revolts. At the beginning of the 1830s, it is reported that 125,000 <clears throat> natives, Native Indians who lived on Millions of acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, Florida, and other states. But by the end of the decade, 10 years later, very few natives remained anywhere in the southern eastern part of the United States. On the behalf of white settlers who wanted the land and the resources and slaves to grow cotton and other cash crops on the native land, the federal government force multiple tribes on multiple occasions. So when they talk about the Trail of Tears, it wasn't a one-time occurrence. Many tribes, several tribes were moved out of different states. Multiple tribes on multiple occasions to walk 800 miles or more from right here in Raleigh or Durham to Memphis, Tennessee, which is on the Mississippi, is 750 miles. So you had to walk to Memphis, Tennessee, or somewhere 750 miles, then cross the Mississippi River, which is a fairly large river, if you've ever seen it. It's a large river. You had to cross the Mississippi, walk through Arkansas into Oklahoma. And that's what they had to do. And hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives on what is called the Trail of Tears. You understand? So we cannot fail to mention this because it was part of what happened during the, the, the American slave trade. Okay, this horribly difficult and deadly journey is known as the Trail of Tears. Genocide is the only word that fits the totality of the destructive force upon the brothers, on our brothers and sisters. Please remember, the oppressor always undercounts the number to minimize the impact of his crimes and to ease his guilt, of which he feels little. He doesn't feel, that's why they trying to take it all of this out of history now, because he don't feel no guilt. He don't want his children to feel no guilt, but he does admit that he is guilty by the action. At the same time of the Trail of Tears, English and Spanish speaking colonizers with the French and the Portuguese and Germans are mapping out the theft and confiscation, confiscation of the entire Western hemisphere. Every inch, they took every inch. They didn't leave none. As the greedy aspirations of the oppressor grows, so does the need for the expansion of the plantation system and the need for more slaves. The slave trade is now in full throttle, operating as the economic engine that runs the rise of the American empire. The profits of the slave trade directly led to the financing of what is called the Industrial Revolution. You understand? With many of the inventions, the Industrial Revolution was a period when, you know, when innovation and, and, and um, inventing new items, you know, were, they put a lot of money and investment in developing these items for commercial purposes. And many of the things that were invented during these times were invented by the slaves. 
but the slave master would take the invention and run down to the patent office and take claim for it. This is the same thing that happens to us today, man. I, I like to use hip hop because it's modern. Everybody knows like we created hip hop, but who gets paid? It's the same thing. It's not different. You understand it's disenfranchisement. You understand this is the same thing. This is the same. We're under the same system. We're being governed by the same people. You understand? Uh, the industrial financing of the industrial revolution with many of the inventions, I must say, coming from the slaves and free blacks who will never be named or get the benefit or the credit for their innovations as the pressure would take credit and run to the patent office. So now the growth of America and the plantation system is now the major source of income and wealth accumulation and investment capital. Insurance companies, they owe their whole creation to slavery because the, ins the, the you know, there's always been insurance, of course, but what I'm saying is the growth of these large companies, you understand, they owe their whole uh, history to slavery. I, I know and when I was in New York, there was a bank called, um, Fleet Bank, and their their model was a sail ship, and in in the back in like ninety two, a brother and sister sued them. You understand for reparations for the money that they had gained from it being from insuring black people, and you know what they did, because they had documentation to prove that their wealth and their growth was related to selling their um ancestors. Fleet Bank was dissolved and absorbed into a Bank of America. You can look it up. You understand? So these companies, all of these companies, progressive, all of these companies, you can trace their monies. You understand? They would enslave the slave. They would insure the slave. But if the slave died or he lost a foot, the slave master get paid. The slave, the slave's family or himself wouldn't receive any compensation at all. They enslaved. They insured the slave ships. So now remember, if you sent three ships to pick up slaves, only one made it back. Only one out of three ships that left to bring slaves back made it back. One out of three. You understand? So the insurance companies, you understand, was making big money off the top. So the insurance industry in America owes us a lot. You understand what I'm saying? They also grew off our backs. You understand? And it can be proven. Okay, so now, all right. So like it. Slavery is now, is the, is the, slavery now is the American way of life and has become standardized with the collaboration with their cohorts in the Car Caribbean and in Europe. The uh, collaborations as far as the treatment and the discipline with mental control methods being implemented. We gotta, re I say that, we gotta remember, everybody know who Willie Lynch is, right? So remember what Willie w Lynch said. He said, if properly instituted among them, it would last among them between 300 and 1,000 years. That's what he said. And surely enough, until this day, some of those traits of division and hate of ourselves and our brothers for any kind of reasons, you understand? Uh, uh, Brother Thabawan said something the other day. I got to mention it because when he said it, I felt it. He said, he said, like, we don't look at each other as, as brothers. You understand? And, and Brother Kawal said, we look at each other as ops. That's what it was said. You know, I, I was thinking about it. You know, that's true. And it's always been true. We, because of this, because of slavery taught us to hate one another. Any kind of difference or any kind of uh, disagreement that we would have amongst each other, the, the, the slave master would magnify it. You understand? To keep this unity and mistrust. And this is breeding in us. You understand what I'm saying? And the only way to overcome this is to come into this truth, man. There's, there's no other way. I don't care what you think or what you feel. There's no other way to overcome these things because the things that are in the truth are the opposite of the things that they applied to us to destroy us. The things in the truth unifies us. You understand? It makes us strong. It gives a cultural identity. 
It gives us a relationship with the most high power, man, who loves us above all the nations of the earth. We don't feel no kind of way when we get out there and we say we're the greatest people that ever walked the face of the earth, man. I love saying it because it's true. I love saying it because it's true. Look what we've done from slavery. Let me let me get my scripture out this. I was gonna hold it. I'll come to it when I get it. I'll come to it. So, excuse me, man. It's messy here. Okay. In fact, it led to the increasing number of plantations as well. Okay, so now we're going to get into the Stagville plantation, okay? Some of us went to the Stagville Plantation. I was there with Commander General Yohanna, and it was an eye-opening event. If, if you want to see something that I'm pretty sure that most of us have never seen, and that's all I'm going to say, just, just go to the, the Stagville, um, what do you call it, the uh, tour, the Stagville tour. It, that place is amazing, and you'll see why when you get there. In North Carolina, the Stagville plantation epitomized plantation life in North Carolina. The largest plantation in North Carolina, in the state, and in maybe in the region, Stagville, the largest of 328 plantations recorded in North Carolina at the height of slavery, Stagville was so large it operated independently like a small city, meaning that they had somebody on Stagville, they had a slave on Stagville that could do any kind of work that could that would maintain a town or a city. Okay. Stagville was owned and operated by the Benahan and Cameron family. Stagville at a at a glance. Okay, so let me get this right here. Thirty thousand acres. Thirty thousand acres. Okay, thirty thousand acres is approx approximately fifty square miles. To give you an idea of how big it is, the island of Manhattan, New York, New York, New York, New York City, New York State, New York County, is. 14,600 acres, or approximately 23 square miles. So the Stagville Plantation was more than twice the size of the island of Manhattan. That's how big it was. You understand? 50 square miles, man. 50. Okay. Stagville was the largest of 10 plantations recorded in Wake and Durham County in this area. It was 10 plantations in this area recorded. Okay, we, I have a list of those plantations. If anybody wants it, I'll be glad to share it. Um, okay, let's see here what we got here. Okay, we got this. Okay, tobacco. Okay. Tobacco was a major crop on Stagville. When I was a young man, until my age again, they used to have a, a brand of cigarettes called Raleigh's. Uh-oh, somebody else remember that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, they were called Raleigh's. You know, they was whack, too. But anyway, they went out of business. <laughs> yeah, I used to smoke them cigarettes, man. But, um, okay. Stagville Plantation, that's where we at. 30,000 acres, okay? Um, you got the slide on the uh, Benahan family? Bob Kishaw. The Benahan Cameron family, now this guy is Benahan. Like, his family, I think they were first came to America in 1727. They landed in New York City. And the rest is a mystery until this guy comes along. This is Richard Banahan. He's a planter, builder, and pioneer in tobacco industry and in education, and was born near Warsaw, 
North Farnham Parish, Richmond County, Virginia. In 1776, Banahan married Mary Amos, daughter of Tommy, Thomas a Amos of Halifax, and sister of a younger Thomas Amos, who distinguished himself in the revolution. In the same year, Benahan made his first purchase of land, 893 acres, three miles northeast from Snow Hill on the west side of the Flat River. From Tyree Harris, who had been sheriff of Orange County during the regular the regulator movement, this was the beginning of the nucleus and the nucleus of Stagville Farintosh complex of plantations on the headwaters of the Noose River, which before the end of the 19th century would amount to more than 30,000 acres. In 1787, Benahan purchased from Judith Stagg, widow of Thomas Stagg, 66 acres of land high on the ridge just west of the River Valley land bought from Tyree Harris some years earlier. Here in 1799, he built a house that was that he called Stagville. Therefore, thus the name Stagville stuck, and that's the name of the plantation, still standing in 1974. By 1800, Benahan owned over 4,000 acres. Across those 4,000 acres, the labor of 44 people were, were used. Two children were born to the Benahan, to the Benahans. Rebecca, who in 1803 married Duncan Cameron. That's why it's called the Cameron Benahan family, okay? With the help of the enterprising son and of Duncan Cameron, a lawyer which was an excellent which with with an excellent head for business, Benahan greatly increased the extent of the land holdings before his death in 1825. Okay, so this is Duncan Cameron. Duncan Cameron studied law. Now, these all of these people, they're educated. You understand? They're, these are educated people. Under Paul Carrington of Charlotte County, Virginia, and was admitted to the bar in North Carolina in 1798. He established himself as a highly successful attorney at Hillsborough. Cameron married Rebecca Benahan in November 20... Uh, November 28, 1778, the only daughter of Richard Benahan. That's the originator, Richard Benahan. okay? And a year after his marriage, he built a mansion house called Farintosh on an elevated site about a mile east of Stagville House. Around this house, he built many dependencies, including his law office, with nearby barns and other utility structures. He also built a chapel in a grove of trees about a quarter of a mile east of the new home and laid off the plot for the family cemetery nearby. And by 1850, he owned many thousands of acres of land reported by some of his contemporaries as the largest plantation east of the Mississippi River. And the reason why we're spending so much time with this cat right here and his family is because they were the ones that owned Stagville. And also, um, the next slide, Baba Kasha. Okay, so this is Duncan Cameron. This is his son, Paul. This is, these are the oppressors, you understand? And they just look the same like oppressors today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what they look like. You understand what I'm saying? So this right here is a building on, I think this is the University of North Carolina, right? And you'll find their names or, or their names uh, on this building. And also there's a record of uh, one of them. I think it was, he made a $3,000 donation to UNC. Meaning, well, back in them days, $3,000 was a big donation. You understand? So when I was saying earlier that you can trace the uh, the foundation and the origins of some of these universities or some of these institutions back to slavery, that's that's one of the instances that we found. This is Paul Carrington. 
Now, when Carrington died in 1853, practically the whole estate was handed down to the second son, Paul. Had at least 30,000 acres and a composite of large plantations. Snow Hill, I think he owned 10 plantations, nine or 10. Snow Hill, Brick House, Stagville and Farrantarch with many adjoining small plantations and farms and lands were spread over three counties, Durham, Granville and Wake County. So they had like, these guys were smart. I'm gonna tell you, give them credit. Like they, they did it, they had everything on these plantations. They had textile um, buildings where they made clothing. You understand they had tanning where they made leather and other products. They, these guys was into everything. Literally, you understand? Uh, these are the plantations that they uh, owned. Bobbitt Plantation, Brick House Plantation, Cameron, Alabama, and they own plantations in different states as well. Alabama Plantation in Green County, Alabama, Cameron, Tunica Plantation, Tunica, Salaka, Tunica Plantation, and Tunica, Mississippi, McCapack Plantation in Person, County, North Carolina, North Point Plantation, Person Plantation, and Mill, Stagville Plantation, Snow Hill Plantation. These guys were filthy rich, man. And so they built, they put their money into a lot of different institutions in North Carolina. You understand what I'm saying? Because that was their contribution to their people. You understand? It was none of this was meant for us at all. You understand? Even though that you understand, we should have inherited that wealth. You understand? And we will. Oh, my goodness. Paul had 1,900 slaves at one time, 1,900. He had 1,000 on Stagville, 900 on the smaller, spread out amongst the smaller plantations. 1,900. 1,900. The water for that, sir. Now, this lovely beast. <laughs> is, is, <laughs> is, <laughs> is Ann Ruffin Cameron. You know, this was the wife of Paul, right? This is Paul's wife. Look at her. She looks like a very tender, kind hearted person. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You understand? So, this, like, one of the things that we don't bring out and it's not talked about is that the, the, the slave master woman, his wife or the slave master as a woman, they were, they were terrible, man. They were wicked as hell. You understand what I'm saying? And they would do anything they could. You know, first of all, they knew that their men were sleeping with the slaves. So that increased their hatred for the slave. So anything that they could do to destroy a slave any slight, if you looked at her, she didn't like it. There goes your foot or something. You know, they're going to cut something off or if they don't kill you, you know. And this woman right here, she was treacherous. You understand? <coughs> they all were. Oh, my God. The water, sir. This is Thomas Ruffin. This is a historical dude right here. He's an historical man. Okay, so we're going to go through the whole list. American jurist and Justice of North Carolina Supreme Court from 1829 to 18... Hell no. And Ruffin was... Ruffin was involved sometimes secretly and illegally in the slave industry. Meaning like he was one of them cats that would pretend like you know, he was an upstanding citizen and he wasn't involved with the with the slave trade, but he had slaves in secrecy. That was done a lot. That was common practice. As a slave owner and as a slave trader, you understand? So you get slaves, you know, you might have an excess, $200 a pop. And slave trader, which led directly to one of his most tenuous rulings protecting the institution of slavery. Delivered, he, this guy right here, Thomas Ruffin, delivered the decision in the case of North Carolina versus Mann in 1830. 
which sanctioned the absolute power of a master over a slave. Absolute power. This is his quote right here. The power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. You had no rights at all, none. You was just an animal that could talk. On our way to the other house, right there. Now, this right here is, is something that everybody, because, like we said, Stackville was a self sufficient, self sustaining, like a city of its own. Everything they needed wood cutting, brick laying, everything the slaves required, um, provided the labor. And right here, we all seen this. All of us that was on the tour, we saw this. We stood right here and touched this. On this part right here, this right here is the knuckle print of one of the slaves. Now, when they were making these bricks, it was so harsh. You know, they had to move quickly. Sometimes they didn't give the brick enough time to dry before they would take the bricks away. And this brother's knuckle print, or sister, could be a sister, Knuckle print is in the brick. And there's another one. I don't think we have that slide where you can see the fingerprint, an actual fingerprint of a human being. They say it's a child's fingerprint because it's very small. But when you go out to the um, tour, to the Stagville tour, it's right here. It's right here. You don't see it. It's right above this, a little bit higher. But these, these brothers and sisters were forced to do all type of labor. You know, you understand, and it was like it was like a production line, like you had to do it quick. They always had quotas. Quotas was mandatory. You had to make a hundred bricks or whatever your quota was. You didn't have time to make it perfect. This brother, you think he had time to make that brick perfect? No, he did that in haste. He didn't get a chance to square it off. You understand, and that's a testament. You understand to the cruelty that happened that occurred on those plantations. You understand? That's what that's about. And you can see that with your own eyes. It's like, oh, this right here, I'm going to tell you something. I've seen a lot of things in my life. A lot. This right here was one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen in my life. This is a barn built by the slaves with not one nail. Not, and when you see how, it don't, you don't even see the size of it. It's three levels. They didn't use not one nail. And I mean, like you see this beam right here, these beams, they cut the beam. And some of the beams were so well fitted, to this day, you can't slide a card through it. Like where they meet, like right here, you can't slide a card. And this is 165 years old. They built it without a nail. Everything was cut perfectly and put into place. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like you get a funny feeling. We, I had a funny feeling when I was in there, you know? I know what it was, but I just had a funny feeling when I was in that building, man. That was an amazing place. And in there, they used to they used to store animals and goods in this place. And this place were built was built by slaves, I think, in 1850, 1860. They finished it in 1860. You understand? At the height, which was at the height of slavery, it was 1860. You understand? And this is a you got to see this, man, to believe it. You understand this, this is something, this is a marvel that I believe that every black, Hispanic, and Native Indian should see. You understand? I didn't know that we had, I knew we had skills. You understand? I knew we always had skills. We was craftsmen and all that. But when you see this, man, how, how you build this without a nail, man? That is utterly amazing, man. And it's still in good condition until this day. And there's one beam that I think, where is it at? It's one beam that runs almost the whole length of the place. It was one tree. They made it out of one tree. That's what the guide was telling us. And it looked like it was less one piece. You understand? So this, you will see this on the tour. This is a testament of the skills that were provided to the slave master for his benefit that we had. You understand what I'm saying? And like, 
you know, they try to make us feel like we can't do nothing, man. But it, this is one of the great things about UBK. We learned that we truly are the greatest people that ever walked the face of the earth. And, and there is nothing that they can do better than us. Nothing at all. You understand? So these are the type of things oh, that, that, that we should embrace as part of our heritage, right? Now, this right here, the brother found this, man. This is an actual list of slave names. This is an actual list. Some of them you can read. You know understand? But this is an actual list of the slaves that were owned. They wrote them down. See, they kept records. You understand? Because, okay, here you see, this is, this is a list of the children born on a slave plantation. And you can read some of the names here. I, I'm half blind, so I ain't going to try to read none of it. So, you know, this, all of this, oh, my goodness, there he is again. <laughs> I like these cats, man, you know, because, you know, they, they, you get a chance to really see the, the, the perpetrators, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's a real perpetrator, you understand right here? And this right here is an actual ad that he took out for the return of a slave. This is an actual ad, you understand? And it tells you about what he looked like. He was a decent, look, good, good countenance. Um, can't read that word. He had a beard, rather of black complexion, meaning he was dark, very sensible, strong, and active. Being a pretty good groom, meaning he was well kept, having taken care of a, a stud horse. So he was good at handling horses. So because he had a skill, he was worth $30 to return him. He was worth $30. And this is the actual ad that they put out to return this brother back to his slave master. Understand? All right. So now we're going to get into the Civil War. Okay. So now we've been told and taught about the Civil War all our lives, right? I mean, I learned about the Civil War when I was in elementary school. We, we learned about the Civil War. The Civil War was always mentioned. It always sounded so heroic. So it always sounded so heroic and good versus evil. We're fighting to free the slaves. That was the basic narrative that we were taught throughout our years. Okay, so there were nine major events or circumstances that led up to the Civil War. And this is the list right here. And we're just going to go through each one as quickly as possible. The compromise of 1850. What this is, is that the North and the South was beefing because they were looking west to the, the territories, Mexico and those territories that they had just acquired in the uh, Louisiana Purchase. So they're looking west at all those territories out there. The Mexicans got all that land out there. We need to get it. And so they're looking out west. And so they can't figure out how they was going to divvy up the land. So they made a compromise. And with that compromise came the 1850 Fugitive Act, which strengthened the ability to punish anybody for assisting slaves in their escape. They raised the amount of money. This was the compromise that they gave to the South to appease them. Because now the South is, is in the North is starting to get beef. Because since um, the slave revolts of 1831 and around that time and David Walker's appeal, the North and the South has become further split on the ideologies and their ways they're gonna move forward in the future, okay? Then there was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin, Uncle Tom is a fictional character, but the book was based on slave narrative where slaves told the story so they took those stories and they condensed it into one fellow. And they also emphasized that he, even though he was an angry black man, he maintained his Christian values. They emphasized that. So he was Uncle Tom's cabin. And what it did was it kind of like showed the cruelties of slavery and it helped to promote the abolitionist movement. Okay. That's Uncle Tom's cabin. Then we have the Nebraska, Kansas Act which was basically another compromise because they wanted 
the southern states wanted these new territories, which they were claiming before they even kicked the Native Indians off of these properties. They were claiming them. And so they're saying, hey, we want slaves. And the North is saying no. So they made a compromise, which was called the Kansas and Nebraska Acts, which basically just um, stalled the, conf take the confrontation. That's basically what it did. Okay? And what they wanted to do is what they had, what they had in mind was now, they had their mind on what was called the Transcontinental Railroad. You understand? And it was a fight over who was going to control the railroad and the routes of the railroad. That's what it was about. You understand? Because they knew they had lots of um, produce and a lot of product to sell and to send out west because they knew that they was going to grow the west. They had already mapped it out. Okay, then we got the Dred Scott decision, right? Now, this is Dred Scott. This was a brother that lived in various states, Alabama, uh, Missouri, and another state. And he, his slave master died, and then he was bought by another slave master who was an army surgeon. And the army surgeon took him into Illinois and Wisconsin, which were free states. So he and his wife sued for their freedom, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Let me see if I got that. Okay, here it is. Uh, who, uh, when his original master died and, his, and he was purchased by an army surgeon, James Emerson, who took Dred Scott into the free state of Illinois and Wisconsin. In 1843, Emerson died. Soon afterward, Dred, Dred was a lucky guy. His slave masters kept dying. So, and his wife, Dred Scott and his wife sued Emerson's widow in federal court for, the, for, for their freedom on the grounds that they had lived in a free territory. Of course, in 1857, the decision went against the Scots when the courts decided that slaves were not entitled to U.S. citizenship, no matter where they had lived and that slaves were property and that the constitutional framers never intended for blacks to be free. That's something we always got to remember. And that as property, Slaves had no rights to which any white man or woman was bound to respect. So that's the reason why this is a very, so from this decision, you understand, the whole um, ideology of slavery was cemented, you understand, as the American way. Because of this, you know, now anybody can say, hey, that, that black man or that black woman don't have no rights. It's the law. You understand? It's the law. Okay? But then we have the Potawatomi Massacre. This was John Brown and his son. He had five sons. And what they did was they killed five um, slave masters and, and supporters, which... Oh, so lucky. They killed so lucky. They The Potawatomi Massacre was an incident where John Brown and his sons and a group of men killed five slave masters and their supporters. You understand? And this caused a big ruckus. And then later on, now John Brown is an abolitionist. You know, he promoted the abolition of slavery and he took up arms to bring it about. And he thought by these events that he perpetrated would incite, you know, an uprising to overthrow slavery. You understand? And he was sadly mistaken. So then it came John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Later on, he attacked at Harper's Ferry a, a United States armory and took it, but they sent General Robert E. Lee, who would become the head of the armies of the Southern states of the Confederacy, as a, I think he was a colonel at the time, went and defeated Brown, you understand? But this further, you understand, agitated the differences between the North and the South. So that's the Harper Ferry incident, you can read about it. They made movies about it. Okay, now this, this one right here was news to me. The election of 1860. This is when Abraham Lincoln was elected president. The South hated Lincoln. Why? Because Lincoln was the first man to run for presidency in the United States who openly talked or spoke about slavery as being wrong. 
But let me tell you something. When you search deeper, it was just talk. Because Lincoln was actually a tool. He wanted that. The North, listen to this. The North was more industrialized and richer than the South at that time. And the North didn't want the South to catch up. You understand? So they put their money behind Lincoln. So Lincoln talked a good game. He talked about anti-slavery, but he was not. He was a co-conspirator in the conquest of the United States. He was in conspiracy with the rich to take America and to take the battle was over the Western lands, which we're going to see. Then we have, they hated Lincoln, man. They hated Lincoln and they, they got him too. You know what I'm saying? But Lincoln was a fraud. I'm going to tell you that right now. They try to portray Lincoln as being a lover of black people. He was not. He didn't care nothing for blacks or Hispanics or Native Indians. Matter of fact, it was under his watch where they, they hanged uh, 31 Native Americans up in, was it Minnesota or Wisconsin? Under his, under his watch. The, the largest mass. The largest mass hanging in American history. They, they hung eight, uh, 31 Native Americans at one time under Lincoln. You understand? The great emancipator. That's a crock, you understand? Now we got the formation of the Confederacy. Okay, next slide, Baba Kacha, next slide. Okay, so Durham, Raleigh Durham, particularly Durham, plays a major part in the surrender of, uh, this is something that they don't really teach that much in history, um, you know, we all know that Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, you understand? But when Lee surrendered under this man, Joseph E. Johnston, he still was in command of 90,000 troops. The troops were stationed, strategically stationed in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And they could have, with 90,000 troops, continued the war on. And this man, out of loyalty to Lee, he surrendered those troops, which saved probably hundreds of thousands of lives with the surrender. He had 90,000 troops still ready to fight. You understand? And he surrendered at a place right here in Durham, Durham called Durham Bennett Place near Durham Station. So Raleigh Durham, Durham plays prominency in a lot of major events in American history that the rest of the country don't know nothing about at all. I know I never heard of none of this stuff. You understand, until I came down here. But um, this is important history because you understand from this came Black Wall Street. You understand, later on. We, my brother's gonna get into that a little bit later. Black Wall Street, what is important about Black Wall Street? It shows us, all these different Black Wall Streets, shows us that we can do it. For the doubters, because everybody in our SUPK know we can do it. But for the doubters of our people that's still in the world, as we say, you know, they might not know. You understand? But we bring these things out so that they can know that we can do anything. You understand? We, there's nothing on this planet that any other nation does that we can't do. Nothing at all. And matter of fact, we will surpass them in just about everything. If they, that's why they don't let us alone. They don't oppress the Chinese man, even though they at war with them. They passed the Chinese, uh, what do they call it? Um, the Chinese anti-hate bill. And they at war with China damn near. But we, black, Hispanics, and Native Indians, we can't get a bill passed. And we've served them faithfully, man, for 400 years. You understand why? Because they know. They seen what the brothers in South America and Central America built. They have seen it. They know what we can do, you understand, if we were left alone. They're never going to leave us alone, you understand? They want to pretend, you understand? They want to isolate us, but still suck us dry, economically and spiritually and mentally. Oh, my brother. Hey, I'm going to give you the honors, brother, please. I'm going to give you the honors for this cat right here because you were the one who brought it out. Brother, you can do it. Come on, brother. This brother right here. <laughs> I'll just read his part, but tell him who he is. He, he was the cat that lived. Yeah. And his story that we just want to hear is, to me, it was almost mind-blowing. Like, 
it is the epitome. I've never heard a case of a more destroyed person than this one. So this is the one. Good luck. Read it, brother. Yeah, there you go. This is what he said. This is after the Civil War. Uh, when the Yankees come, they didn't do so much harm, only they told us we was free niggas. But I always feel like I belong to Massa Paul, and I still live at Stagville on the old plantation. I has a little garden and does what I can to earn a little something. The Lord and fixed it so now that I will get a little pension, and I'll stay right on in that little house till the good Lord calls me home. Then I will see Massa Paul once more. You know, this brother done like, and then there's, there's an account also where he was at the gate one time when the master was coming back to the plantation. He loved the master so much. The master didn't even know who he was. He didn't even know who he was. But he, <laughs> but he's so destroyed that he loved the slave master so much that he wanted to see the he wanted to be with the slave master in heaven, man. That's what he's saying, man. Can you imagine being a slave and want to be with the slave master in heaven? That's what he said. When he said, let me see, then I will see the master once more. <coughs> That's destroyed, man. That is destroyed. I haven't, I don't know. I, I might be wrong, but I, I would like to see a better case than that. Because I haven't seen it. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, man. Okay, so let, let me finish off this Civil War. And then I'll be done. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go into the formulation. The last thing that was on the list was the formulation of the Confederacy. Okay? The formulation of the Confederacy, like the, the, the South was, hey, man, we getting this money like this. You understand? In the North, they getting their money their way, man. We just need to separate from them and keep these slaves because this is our cash cow. So, about weeks, a few weeks, less than six weeks after, this, after the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, in Charleston, South Carolina, a group of 169 delegates from various states met, and the, they were meeting to vote on succession from the United States. 60% of the delegates were slave owners, of course. You understand? So they're meeting to, to, to map out their future. And, and slavery is at the center of it, but it's not the reason for it. The local residents celebrated. Okay, hold on a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. The vote was unanimous. All 169 delegates voted to succeed to leave the union. The local residents celebrated with parades and bonfires and ringing of church bells. Five more states, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, and Louisiana soon followed. The representatives of those six states met in February, February of 1861 to establish a new unified government called the Confederate States of America. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was elected president and joined the, Confeder the Confederacy in March after the Confederate forces attacked Fort Sumter, Lincoln ordered federal troops to retake it. Then four more states, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, and North Carolina joined the Confederacy. There were 15 slave states, including North Carolina. And it was on. The Kansas, well, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 that created territories of land not yet totally secured or stolen passed by the 33rd Congress and signed into law by President Franklin Pierce. The law was intended to open lands to development and to facilitate the construction of a transcontinental railroad. You see, these are the things that this war was really about. You understand? A transcontinental railroad was big business. Uh, Sto uh, this move, well, the Missouri Compromise, helped stoke the national tensions over slavery. 
and contributing to a series of armed conflicts that developed into full-scale civil war. So let's cut to the chase. We, the real motivation, Salakia, for the war was greed and oppression. Simply put, the South wanted to expand slavery into the new territory, while the North wanted its own authority to govern and make decisions in the new territory. That it was purely economical. They didn't love us. We all know that, but we're just making it known. They didn't love us. They didn't fight the Civil War to free us. That's a bunch of, we still in slavery, y'all. That's the proof in itself, man. Are you free? Do you depend on your slave master for everything? As the scriptures say, hell yeah, we do. Hell yeah, we do. Okay. Thus, it was really a battle over how and who of the oppressors were going to control the accumulation of wealth and the resources from these new territories. The ability of the oppressors to change and rewrite history and to tell the lie that the Civil War was for to free, to free the slaves is a lie, straight like that. It, to make Abe Lincoln a hero or a savior of black people is untrue at best, or that he cared at all for blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indian is a lie. The truth is, by deed and definition, Lincoln was a co-conspirator in the greatest land grab, the greatest genocide in the history of the planet Earth. And our people must understand the fact that blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians, so-called, were still, were and still are the victims of the greatest and most wicked economic endeavor ever to take place on the planet Earth. And, and, and that's basically all I got. But I just want to say this, like, this history right here is so important because we understand, an, we understand another uh, aspect of how we got to this point. And we also understand how valuable we really are. They understate or underestimate our value to us, while to them, you understand, we are still the cash cow. Look at look at the situation with um, Kanye. They booted Kanye out, stripped him of his billions, and now they come back begging. Now I don't really care that much for bon uh, Kanye. I think he's a a a hole. You know, that's my personal opinion. But we got to give the brother credit. He stood strong against them, and they came. Um, uh, what is it, Nike or is it uh, Adidas? Adidas came back crawling to get him back. We, and that proves what we're saying here. It's all about money. Understand? So with the return of Black Wall Street, it is essential that we understand what they understood. Those Black people understood how important it was to be self-sufficient and do for yourself. That's what it's about. And we have to understand. And ISU, we're not talking about us, because we already know. We know. That if we don't do it together, we ain't going to get it done. It ain't going to get done if we don't get up and do it. You understand? But for our brothers and sisters that's still out there in the world that, that, just, that think we out here playing some kind of game or looking for some kind of false glory, you're sadly mistaken. We are here doing the work of the Lord without financial gain. We're not going to rob you. We're not going to molest your children. None of these things, man. Come to the Passover, y'all. Come to the Lord's 54th annual Passover, April 1st, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, man. And see, man, what I've seen, man. I, I, you know, I'm 60. I'm about to be 65. I don't care about none of that. I'm about to be 65 years old. And I, I didn't know what brotherhood was until I was 61 years old when I came to the school. And I'm telling you now, I was not a brother to my brothers in the world. I was not. I was a destructive bastard. You understand? Selfish as hell. So these brothers is wringing all of that shit out of me. But um, so like, but um, I'm just being real about it, you know? And it's important, you understand, to understand the value of this brotherhood, man. You understand? Without this brotherhood, man, we ain't nothing, man. Without brotherhood, man, ain't nobody nothing. You understand? And, and with that, that's all I got. Shalom. The water.
the water. Get that brother another hand, man. Damn right. That research is exquisite. Well, then what he said is, is so heavy too, and that's really the crux of this whole um, this whole lecture. Is none of this makes sense without brotherhood. And by the end of this lecture, we're gonna see everybody that's not in here looks like him to us. Every single one of them looks like him. And again, this brother was destroyed. This brother was destroyed many years before the truth came out. But guess what? You got people right now with ISUBK.com, ISUBK144 is alive, and they still want to be like Doc Edwards. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I want to read something uh, real quick, if I could. Salakia. From this book. Very interesting to show you how much brothers like him, and again, not ragging on him, not just going in on him, but just this image. You know, we, we, the reason, part of the reason why we still see Brothers like this, as uh, Officer Yanazar said, is because this is how they want us to be. Really, don't, don't think that this is it's a coincidence. When you see them brothers that just, you know, we, we be at camp and they just love the oppressor so much and we in here, so we look at them like, well, what's wrong with, what's wrong with son? Like, what's, what's the deal? Well, this is how cats like him came to be uh, memorialized in the era that's going to come up after uh, the Civil War. We're going into Reconstruction with Officer of a thousand bunk, y'all has a, a great presentation prepared for you. But during that time, this is what this book says. This book is at the hands of persons unknown, the lynching of black America by Philip Dre. This is an extensive history of the lynchings that took place all throughout the United States and mostly the Southern United States from reconstruction all the way up into the sixties and seventies, right? So uh, in his book on uh, page 70, 74, he says, not surprisingly, the era saw a flourishing of sentimental nostalgia among whites over the old days when folks knew their place, out of which was born a powerful cult of the Mammy. Images of Mammy as a loving exemplar of stability, simultaneously the enforcer and nurturer of Southern custom began to appear in newspaper advertisements and on billboards. Essayist penned serious tributes to her memory in 1899. Newspaper ads. In 1899, Newman, Georgia, Herald and Advisor celebrated her, uh, celebrated her, the Mammy, along with her male counterpart. Everyone knows about the Mammy. Everyone knows about Aunt Jemima. But people don't know that phrase, you know, you say that uncle. It's say, uncle so-and-so, uncle so-and-so. Well, guess what? During the time of Mammy, the male version of Mammy was called uncle or uncle Ned or, or some, some, kind of, some kind of cute little you know, black name. That's why uh, when she wrote that book, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, because that's what they were called. Check this out. It says um, they celebrated her along with her male counterpart, counterpart the eunuch-like Uncle Ned. That's another heavy thing you got to understand is that the, the image of the mammy always had to be what? She had to be a big, you know, remember, see, whoever seen Tom and Jerry? Ever seen Tom and Jerry? And, you know, you had that, that black woman. They never really show her, but they show her feet and the slippers, and she's the big black mammy walking around, and she's the one in charge of the house. But they always had to make her in a way where she wasn't sexually tantalizing. She never was attractive or had, at, from their standards. She was just, you know, all she cared about was her chillings. All she cared about was taking care of the little oppressor babies. Well, Uncle Ned, as he was called, was similar. In fact, right here, they called him eunuch-like. He, he was almost like a castrated male. I wonder why that's so important to them. But this is what they said. This is a newspaper article from 1898, an advertisement. It says... As we stand on the verge of a new century and gaze down the dim vista of the past, we behold the decrepit and trembling figure of the old antebellum darkie as he slowly marches to the grave. No stronger love ever existed than that of old Uncle Ned for his master. This is white people talking, by the way. This is not something that uh, a brother like him wrote. This is how the oppressor <laughs> looked at him. They knew how much he loved them and what he would go through. He's going to say more. No sweeter songs were ever sung than those which came from the lips of old black mammy. By Salakia, by which we closed our weary eyes in sweet slumber 
with a confidence which she alone could inspire. Never fearing for a moment the intrusion of some nocturnal marauder, as long as old Mammy's watchful eye was over us, and the faithful old darky keeping a sleepless vigil over his chillin', whom he loved and for whom he would consider death a small sacrifice. So when the ISUPK and the commanding general Yohanna goes out to the street corners and we read the scripture that says that their nursing fathers or their, 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 their kings and their queens shall be our nursing fathers. This is a blatant descriptive. You are looking at the image of our kings who were their nursing fathers. And when you see Aunt Jemima in the mammy image, that's our queens. We know we wouldn't call them queens, but you know, that's just the, the sort of the prominent women were their nursing mothers. Okay. So now when we lead up to the reconstruction, we're going to see that this image right here is what our people were trying to destroy. We were trying to get away from this. As Alan Locke said at the beginning of the uh, of the lecture, when he said the time of what? The time of mammies and uncles is dead. That's what we were trying to go against, all right? So, um, most high in Christ, the water for everybody, you know, uh, 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 rocking out with us. We're going to take a quick, just little 10 minute uh, intermission, get up, stretch, you know what I mean? Go to the bathroom if you got to, get you some food, whatever you got to do, or whatever. When we come back, uh, Officer of a Thousand Bunk, he is going to begin his uh, presentation on uh, Black Wall Street, all right? <laughs> Shalom, Israel. And when I mean Israel, I'm talking about the black, Hispanic, and Native Indians. The Lord's 54th annual Passover is going down again this year, sundown, April 1st, at 500 South Salisbury Street in Raleigh, North Carolina, at the Battle National Hospital. We've got enough room for all of us. The Lord's 54th annual Passover. Last year, brothers and sisters showed up in all over the world like the ancient and glory of our house in order to serve the most high in Christ. Now it's that time again. Many boys are putting out the decree for all brothers and sisters to show up. Sundown, April 1st, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Join us at the Sheridan in Raleigh, the hotel right downtown. It's at 421 South Salisbury. The Passover is right on the clock.
200 for every adult over the age of 17 years old.
Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. So log if everybody could. So lock it to the men above me, first and foremost. If y'all get a chance to uh, take your seats, we're going to get into the uh, part two, the, the second part of the lecture. We're going to talk about uh, the Black Wall Street. You know what I'm saying? All right. So if you could just, uh, we got about a minute or two. Everybody just please take your seats. The water. Check, check. Hey, Shalom. Yahweh Bahashim, Yahweh Shabrak, Athar of the brothers. Yahweh Shamar, Athar Bahashim, Yahweh Shah of my sisters. I'm priest and officer of a thousand Bon Kayal, coming out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. And this is the Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge. All right. And I just wanted to say the water to Commanding General Yohanna, you know, for holding on to this truth since 1969, man. Before that, um, this is a tremendous opportunity. And I'm grateful for that. I also want to say, uh, the water to Captain I thought for allowing us access to such a tremendous and invaluable platform before all of Israel. Uh, and I also want to have a personal shout out to Officer Zion Ya'ala uh, for his direct and sincere example. But uh, beyond that, we're going to get this thing started. I'm grateful for everyone in attendance and tuning in to this lecture. We're getting into the uh, Durham's Black Wall Street. Hit the next slide, Baba Kushan. So this is, uh, we're gonna talk about reconstruction, but I kind of wanted to talk about just my personal experience, getting, gathering all this information for the sake of this lecture. We went to Stackville and it was rough, man. It was absolutely rough unpacking uh, just the emotional trauma from walking on the grounds where our ancestors walked on, walking through the slave quarters, and you know, touching the bricks and just feeling the draft coming through the buildings. 
it was a lot to unpack, and I'm still unpacking it. But uh, in the effort to collect meaningful details with regard to the history of what occurred right here in North Carolina, personally, I was overwhelmed with the amount of information regarding this story. Overwhelmed with the fact that much, if not most, of this history has been intentionally hidden, suppressed, withheld from the mass understanding of the populace uh, from our people. Uh, being formally educated in the curriculum of the North Carolina school systems, grade school, high school, college, uh, through the late 80s and early 2000s, uh, there has been a tremendous disservice enacted upon our youth and their education. Our children are being robbed of fundamental truths about our real history. It's been suppressed by religious leaders, political pundits, and the dominant ruling class of society. This lecture isn't solely about me and my experiences, but about us as a collective, getting back to the root of who we are as a people, as a separate nation. All right, so we're talking about reconstruction right now. And this was a post-Civil War period uh, that lasted between 1865 and 1877. This is post the Emancipation Proclamation. So everybody uh, feels some type of way about Abraham Lincoln. If you black, Hispanic, and Native Indian, you have to understand that Lincoln was nothing more than an oppressor. He was our enemy. Um, let me pull up this, uh, what he actually said with respect to uh, freeing the slaves. You know, this was uh, the period in which the 11 states that seceded from the Union, okay, they were uh, ushered back in, almost like the prodigal son. You know, they recognized value in each other, being brothers, you know. They were brothers fighting against brothers of North versus South. But at the end of all that, we're still outsiders, all right? So that's what we have to understand. You'll never be able to assimilate or conform and to be fully accepted into America. But uh, Lincoln, this is what he said in his writings to uh, Horace Greeley, okay, August the 22nd, 1862. This is a clipping uh, from the Daily National Intelligencer from Washington, D.C. And this is what he said. Just a lock in. It's a PDF, so it's real small. He says, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the color race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. All right. So it was nothing. It had nothing to do with freeing you, black man, Hispanic man, Native Indian man. It had everything to do with the brothers, the brotherhood of, of America, okay, being, you know, one of the greatest corporations on the planet, you know, but it beyond that, uh, so the period of Reconstruction, you have to understand there was a mass populace of a uh, labor force, skilled labor force that was leaving the plantations, okay? What we have to understand about slavery is that it wasn't all agricultural, all right? That's a misnomer. Niggas wasn't just relegated to the field, Salakia. Negroes were not just relegated to the field. <laughs> to the field uh, or to domestic duties on the plantation grounds, but we also had uh, urban and industrial slavery. So think about every job that you work in America right now, but you work in that job without getting a paycheck, all right? That's what America was before the Emancipation Proclamation all right, was signed. So you have to, to really put yourself in the mind of us coming off the plantation with definitive skills. We had soft skills. We had hard skills. You know what soft skills are, right? Soft skills like, you know, time management, communication, being able to work well with others, you know, but, but hard skills are those skills that actually identify and outline your vocation. So, you know, like a seamstress or um, we'll just say a blacksmith or a tailor or um, a brick mason. They have definitive hard skills, all right? And we had hard skills coming off the plantation. Uh, the Brother Yanazar talked about the barn. That took 
uh, engineering. That took engineering um, brothers that were adept at in engineering. You know, we had plumbers before there was, you know, any any major system of plumbing in Durham. You know, we had electricians like, you know, um, Officer Yahawada, <laughs> Salakia. Uh, I got to shout you out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But just like today, you know, we have brothers in our nation that have these definitive skill sets, and we should employ, you know, the use of those, those skills. You know, before you go and just go to a, a, an oppressor or to another nation, you should reach out. Ask your camp leader. Reach out to the brothers in your camp. Reach out to the brothers in your, sister, in your, in your city and in your zone and see what brothers are doing and if you can be helped, you know, because that's what these brothers did we're going to talk about here soon. All right, let's see. Um, but yeah, with respect to reconstruction, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are very, very important. The 13th Amendment basically was uh, free the slaves off the plantation. The 14th is the amendment made you a human being, okay? Um, which is really interesting about our experience with slavery. We were dehumanized. We were absolutely dehumanized and uh, relegated to cattle. And it's really hard for me to think about that. You look at your children, you look at your family, and it's just really difficult to, you know, recognize that we really haven't come that far from the plantation. You know, we really haven't. This, all these could be repealed. All these could be ratified. And we could be right back on the goddamn plantation, all right? So and we talk about the 15th Amendment uh, with respect to voting. Black men got the, um, the right to vote before white women, you know, which is really, really interesting. Um, next slide. Yeah, you can go past that bastard. All right, so what you see here during the Reconstruction period, we're coming off the plantation. You were property. You did not own property, okay? So what you see here is us being issued rations, us being issued shoes and, and clothing, okay? And this is really interesting because I think about the scripture in Deuteronomy where it says, for one of all things, you know, this right here, us having to depend upon the oppressor to feed and clothe us, you know, coming off the plantation is like, whoa, this is wild. Um, but these are some of the images, uh, the illustrations that I, that I uh, took offline, uh, and you can see all over, you know, wherever we were emancipated in America, this is what was happening. Um, the Union Army, the Union soldiers were primarily responsible for issuing uh, out these rations, these resources. Uh, they set up normal schools like they did with the Native Indian. The Native Indian went through a process where they what? They kill the Indian, but they save the man, all right? Uh, and that's to get them acclimated to living in white society, okay? So now you see um, Chief Bighorn wearing a suit instead of him wearing fringes. Same thing happened with us, all right? This is how I know that this school is the home of the truth because nowhere else are we being taught that the Native Indians are our brothers, all right? Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, and so look at that. This is us in classrooms uh, learning. Uh, learning how to acclimate into white society, all right? And in these normal schools, you'll see that the brothers that we talk about, they all had very similar experiences. Um, they grew up in segregated uh, classrooms. Unlike us, we didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to learn amongst one another. We had to learn next to devils. We had to learn next to the other nations, all right? These, these brothers here, they are, they're coming off of slavery. They're coming off of the experience of, of knowing that they were once owned, and now they can own things. So you can just imagine the psyche of the, these, these individuals, you know, our brothers and sisters, man. You know, I couldn't imagine knowing that I can actually own something, and it belongs to me, and no one can take it from me, okay? Next slide, Baba Kusha. All right. So in the midst of Reconstruction, especially here in the South, predominantly, we have what you call Jim Crow, all right? And uh, Jim Crow, 
Jim Crow was bad. You know, this added another element to the separation of the nations. All right. And it was not cost effective. I've read that with respect to Jim Crow, instead of just having one water fountain, now you have to purchase two water fountains. All right. Instead of you just having one bathroom like they have today, you had to purchase two sets of bathrooms. All right. So economically, it's not feasible. Okay. But when it comes down to segregation, we know the value of that in here in this school. We know the value of us being separated from the other nations because in us being separated, we have to depend upon one another, you know, for survival. All right. But with respect to Jim Crow, um, yeah, this is this is this is definitely a disgusting thing, and I can't help but to think like, okay, so they separated. They said separate but equal, but they played on very very um, false narratives and um, caricatures of you know, like with with respect to our lips, our physical features, our pheno phenotypical characteristics. They always over accentuate our lips or you know, our hair, you know how ODB will wear his hair, you know, like a, like a pickaninny or whatever. And they made, they made it seem like all of our children or all of us had hair like that, which is the reason, another reason why, you know, I feel cheated because growing up, you know, I was an athlete. In order for you to play on the basketball team in my hometown of Fayetteville, at the school I went to, you had to cut your hair. Okay. Now via today's standard, oh man, we would have, that was, that was a lawsuit. We could have had Cumberland County by the you-know-whats, you know? But we didn't know this. And this is the danger of Christianity. This is the danger of just being joined to white society. Let me see. All right, next slide, Baba Kushaw. All right, so with respect to Reconstruction also, with us getting the rights that we got from the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, we had agitators in the South, Southern loyalists, individuals that did not want to see a change in the way of life. Can you imagine owning Toby? And then now Toby, he's got rights. And he, he, he can, you know, come and go as he pleases. He don't have to check in with you, you know? Um, this is scary, you know? When you think about the Ku Klux Klan arose out of the Reconstruction era, all right? They had all sorts of different... Uh, leagues that that arose um for the sake of suppressing uh black liberation or black freedom all right hold tight i'm pulling my notes up here so this was a, a very turbulent era when we talk about reconstruction uh following the civil war it was the effort to reintegrate southern states from the confederacy and four million newly freed people into the United States. That was a tremendous amount of people, 4 million people, all right? Under the administration of President Andrew Johnson in 1865 and 1866, the new Southern state legislators passed restrictive black codes uh, to control the labor and behavior of former enslaved people and other African-Americans. So they always, uh, you always hear them say, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, all right? That's cool and all, but First of all, we didn't have boots. If you read the slave narratives, many of the slaves' accounts, they talk about the wintertime and dreading the wintertime, especially here in North Carolina. You know, they talk about how slavery uh, was not successful in the northern states because six months out of the year, the ground is frozen. So if you, if you owned a, a plantation in the north, you would have to provide your slaves with adequate footwear, all right? But in the south, not so. So a lot of... Stagville specifically, a lot of those slaves walked around barefoot. And I went outside to check the mail the other day and regretted every second of it. I couldn't feel my toes, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what the hell? But I thought about, I thought about my brothers and sisters, you know? Frostbite is a real thing. Uh, uh, being exposed to the elements, overexposure, hyperthermia, hypothermia. These things really affected us, you know? Um, you can go to the next slide. All right, so one of the primary agitators to uh, the black plight leaving the plantation was the, the Ku Klux Klan, all right? And you see, they got, 
you know, they're, they're real red-blooded Americans, okay? They, 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 pledge a loot, they pledge allegiance to the flag, okay? And they burn crosses. What does that cross represent, though? This cross represents Christianity, okay? So these, these are two things that if you black and speck and native Indian, when you see these two things symbolically, you should automatically know that they are against you, all right? And you should not uh, feel a sense or desire to uh, pledge your allegiance to them, all right? Uh, let's see. So outrage in the North over these codes eroded support for the approach known as presidential reconstruction and led to the triumph of the more radical wing of the Republican Party. All right. During radical reconstruction, which began with the passage of Reconstruction Act of 1867, newly enfranchised black people gained a voice in government for the first time in American history, winning election to southern state legislators and even to the U.S. Congress. So we have to understand that us trying to join them, us trying to join their political systems, that's not beneficial to us as a whole. You can look at the so-called Chinese man or the Asians and they have little to no representation with respect to, to, to public policy, but they have an effect on public policy, as the brother brought out earlier, that stop Asian hate crime bill, you know? But when you think about um, crimes against any group of marginalized people, we're always on the bottom, but we get no representation. We don't get any legislation to protect us that definitively works, okay? Uh, so we talk about, in less than a decade, however, reactionary forces, including the Ku Klux Klan, uh, will reverse the changes wrought by radical reconstruction and the violent backlash that restored white supremacy in the South. That's what this is about. When you see that flag, think white supremacy. When you see that cross, think white supremacy. When you see a church, you should know that that is a den of iniquity. And what they do in there is brainwash you to believe in a white Jesus, in a white God, in white angels, in white prophets, in white patriarchs. The only time you see a Negro was during the nativity scene during Christmas. And that's a lie when it comes down to what we know about the Bible. All right. Next slide, Baba Kusha. All right. So we talked about the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment. Let's get to the 15th Amendment. We're talking about voting, all right? We know that we're not supposed to go and vote for, to set someone else uh, from another tribe as king over us, right? So us going to the polls and, and you know, I, I admit, not me, but the, the brother that got put to death, you know, voted for Obama both terms. I didn't understand that I wasn't an African. I didn't understand that Obama was an African and he was a separate uh, nation came from a separate nation of people. It took this school to teach me that. Okay. Uh, but with respect to these bastards, these are uh, what you call the red shirts. And when you think about uh, voter suppression, which is a real big thing uh, here in North Carolina, people that are on fixed incomes, they want to say, oh, you have to have an ID card. Well, how much does an ID card cost? Anybody been to the, the, the driver's license office? You know, it's a lot of red tape just trying to get an appointment. You go in there, they're always swamped. You take a ticket, you'll be in there. And most of us have to be at our slaveries. This is how I know we're not removed from the plantation. Because without that slavery, if you don't work, you don't eat. All right? Um, but imagine going to the polls and you got this gang of bastards standing there, spewing obscenities, spitting at you, you know, uh, urging you to come. Yeah, come cast your vote, Negro. You know they didn't say that. And they're responsible for a lot of, of, of murders, a lot of assaults on, you know, black people that wanted to exercise their right to vote here in America, okay? In addition to the Ku Klux Klan. And there's another group called the Bourbons. You need to look them up, all right? Um, next slide, Baba Kusha. Uh, yeah. So uh, what, go to slide nine. If you can go back to slide nine, I'd appreciate that. So we're talking about other notable Black Wall Streets. And I wanted to talk about what a Black Wall Street actually is. I got three separate definitions. 
uh, slide nine. Yeah, that's the one. The water. So Black Wall Street, what is it? How many people are familiar with the term Black Wall Street? Yeah. Okay, most high in Christ. Uh, and what are they? So this is according to one of the books I have back here, Upholding Black Durham, by an individual named Leslie Brown. It says... Black Wall Streets were thriving black communities of businesses and professionals which generated impressive wealth and capital accumulation among so-called African Americans, all right? And we also have another definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Black Wall Street, a term more generally applied to district This is according to The Root, which is a, an online magazine. It says regions or zones within major municipalities given the moniker Black Wall Street because of the number of successful businesses and wealthy Black inhabitants. Uh, between the Civil War and the end of Reconstruction, there were many Black communities that thrived economically solely based on the Black dollar, all right? important that we recognize that. Oh, man. So some of the more less commonly known Black uh, Wall Streets, you talked about Jackson Ward and Richmond. Um, I actually have a slide that talks about um, all of the businesses and the taxes that they paid to the state of Virginia. We're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Um, but, you know, Chicago, Illinois, Bronzeville, 9th Street in Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, got Auburn Avenue in Atlanta and Ferris Street in Jackson, Mississippi. This is uh, where, you know, Deion Sanders just left Jackson, you know, for the sake of what? Hey, can I get some tissue or something? Cool. So lock in. <laughs> the water. All right. So in Jackson Ward, specifically in Richmond, Virginia, uh, a.k.a. the Harlem of the South, due to Hust, uh, so lock in. Due to hosting big names of the black elite in entertainment during the early uh, 1900s, like Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, and Bill Bojangles Robinson, who was from uh, that area, all right? Since newly freed slaves occupation of an area on the northern edge of Richmond's downtown district, the emergence of a plethora of black businesses within the predominantly black community called the birthplace of black capitalism. And we know that capitalism... Oh, the water. It's a lock yet. We know that capitalism is uh, the religion of America, all right? They worship mammon or worship money in America. You know, all of our music, all of our entertainment is geared toward us solely focusing on securing a bag, okay? And it's not about you uh, loving the Lord with all your heart. It's not about you being obedient to keeping the law, statutes, and commandments. It's about you chasing this piece of paper. All right, which is a very futile thing. And once you get it, you realize, you know, you'll never be really happy. Um, or the pursuit of happiness, which is outlined in the, the Declaration of Independence. You know, uh, you mentioned John Locke earlier, and he talks about, you know, uh, owning property and the pursuit of happiness. So whatever, whatever makes you happy, you should be fully um, allowed to do that in this land called America. But when I read the Bible, it don't say that. And that's the problem, all right? So you have to understand if you black, Hispanic, or Native Indian, there's a certain way by which you're supposed to live. Our Constitution is the Bible, all right? Don't put your, your hope in the Constitution of America, all right? This is the reason why the Black Wall Streets failed before, okay? And we're trying to return to a Black Wall Street. And I hate saying Black Wall Street like the so-called oppressor sets you know, the bar for excellence, because they don't, all right? If you black, Hispanic, or Native Indian, you are the salt of the earth, all right? Next, uh, go back to the uh, the other slide, Baba Kusha. All right. So there were certain big-headed Negroes, uh, <laughs> like uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, that left an impression on our oppressor, so much so that they were given um, platforms, all right? You think about Frederick Douglass, they prop Frederick Douglass up before you every February. You learn about Frederick Douglass, but Frederick Douglass' father was a so-called oppressor. 
he wasn't a Negro, okay? So you have to really wonder, like, are the people that are being propped up before me actually for me, all right? And oftentimes they're not. Oftentimes these people have, have curbed their ways and they have sold out in back rooms, back offices. They've sold you up and down the river, all right? Um, yeah, we can uh, go to the next slide, Baba Kusha. All right, Freedmen's Bureau. So we talked about, this is a, a political cartoon, all right? <laughs> and it pisses me off to see this because I don't know too many Negroes like this, all right? Every Negro I know is getting up, getting out, and getting something every day of the week. They don't have the ability to just sit at the crib like that, okay? But when it comes down to the Freedmen's Bureau, this is this what was uh, pushed out to the masses. And you got to understand, a lot of us can't read or write, so they had to be very um, detailed with respect to the illustrations. So the illustration had to speak to you; it had to jump off of the page. You know, you got to think most Southern whites couldn't even read or write. Okay, so don't feel bad if you are illiterate, if you Black, Hispanic, or Native Indian. You know, the Bible talks about us. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it says, I know thy poverty, right? We don't have a reason to be ashamed. We don't, all right? Anyhow, um, so the Freedmen's Bureau was, uh, you can read this, uh, it was set up to assist us, almost like uh, the Social Security Department is today. You think about the certain um, supports that we receive because we're disenfranchised, because we're marginalized, you think about the food benefits that you have to get from WIC, from EBT, you know, from the SNAP benefits that we receive. We have to go to our oppressor for these things. We're not that far removed from this at all. Next slide, Baba Kusha. It's another um, political editorial cartoon, okay? And you see, it's usually us dying, you know, or us, us wounded you know, or us, us, us being relegated to being the victim always, you know, and what I, what I, what I really learned about uh, when you talk about Black Wall Streets, they automatically talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma, because of the tremendous violence that we endured in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That was one of the very first domestic uh, acts of terrorism on citizens, on American citizens, okay? What, you talk about uh, the oppressor dropping bombs over Baghdad, they drop bombs over Greenwood, all right? Um, but the reason why they talk about Tulsa is because of the tremendous violence that, you know, um, occurred there. And that, that intention, they want to put a seed of, of fear within you, within your psyche. This is what happens when you decide to go into business for yourself. This is what happens when you decide to, you know, place value upon your communities. This is what happens. You know, and that's what the so-called oppressor wants us to believe. That's why they push Tulsa and they suppress Black Wall Street and Durham. All right. Next slide, Baba Kusha. Yeah, this is another one. And we're, we're going to come back to this one. But this one here really pisses me off because Duke University is named after um, a very prominent, um, I guess you can say, farming uh, family here in, in this area. Um, these are very wealthy landowning oppressors. Um, but Washington Duke and his two sons, their company, you know, they, that's their claim to fame is, is tobacco. You know, they say cotton was king in the South, but we had a different gold rush here in North Carolina. We had that tobacco gold leaf, um, which was, everybody loved it. I don't, I don't know. I've never, tasted uh, gold leaf tobacco, but apparently it's everything, or it was everything in the early 1900s. But you can see us here. They got what you would call a pickaninny, sitting there rubbing her feet together, eating the dang on rind of watermelon, and you got Mammy right here with her head wrapped up, okay? And what is this? Uh, I don't even know if that's a baby or if that's a, a doll, but you see the pigs, usually a pig pen or a pig style would be, you know, hundreds of feet from the home. So they're trying to say that we, they want to equate us to animals again, all right? You wouldn't see that on a farm. You know how we are. You don't want to smell a pig, let alone see it, you know what I'm saying? But 
That's what they thought of us. Why, why is the bull further away from the house than the pig and the chickens? Don't make sense. But anybody that's looking at this, the so-called white society will look at that and say, oh, they're filthy animals. They're disgusting, okay? And there's something special about this watermelon. Um, for a long time, I wouldn't eat watermelon because, you know, of the negative um, stereotypes about watermelon that the, the Ku Klux Klan pushed during Reconstruction. But you got to understand, when it comes into that watermelon, and I learned this when I went to Stagville, um, outside of P.D. Green, y'all saw P.D. Green eat the watermelon, right? Google P.D. Green eating watermelon. Hilarious. Um, let me pull this picture up real quick. And I should have put it in the, in the slideshow. Um, yeah. So lock in. Anyhow, I can't find the picture right now. But this watermelon was one of the crops that we grew in order for us to sustain ourselves. So if you lived on a plantation, you have to understand we had meager rations. We had to have things to supplement our diet. So the same way, <clears throat> if you want anything extra than what your slavery provides, you pick up a second job or you go to school at night. What we would have to do is um, cater to our gardens. If you had somewhat of a benevolent um, master over the plantation, he might allow you to grow certain crops on his land, okay? But those were still his crops. You couldn't take those crops and go sell them and then have money because you would, you know, your property. You're not supposed to own anything, right? But this watermelon uh, was symbolic to our independence. And that's why the Ku Klux Klan attacked it, all right? So you have to understand that. And we also grew okra and black eyed peas and yams and so on and so forth. These are the things that, you know, whenever you see a brother on the side of the road selling watermelon, stop. This is very um, symbolic to us, to our uh, origin story here in America. I always show love to them. I don't care if the watermelon is 20 bucks. Show them some love, you know what I'm saying? Next slide. All right, the rise of black enterprise. This is interesting right here. This is the resident staff of Lincoln Hospital. All black residents, all black doctors here, all right? Um, and you see um, m and uh, Then we also have another prominent family. Keep going. Next slide. Now you too, what, brother. All right. Now, here are the key characters. Check these brothers out, man. Ice cold, all right? Now, I ain't going to tell you which of whom are not actually Israelites, but um, most of them are Israelites, okay? And a lot of them had Israelite mothers that um, endured being raped on the plantation, okay? And so I can't help but to think about uh, and a part of the curses, our sons and our daughters will be given to another people. Let's just imagine, you know, you're a sister on a plantation. You're not, you're not wanting to have a, a baby by a so-called oppressor. But if he creeps in your room, you can't tell him no. So one of these, a few of these brothers are the byproduct of that, all right? Um, so, yeah, let's get to it. So right here, the first brother... Yeah, most high Christ. The water. Yeah. <clears throat> this is John Merrick, man. I really appreciate this brother. He had a tremendous zeal. Uh, there's a certain brothers in, there's a few brothers in the room that had the same zeal of John Merrick. Visionaries. Um, this brother uh basically he went to a, a normal school in Chapel Hill. All right. His mother ended up marrying someone that moved to the north. She left the south. She got sick and tired of living down here. So he was working on the brickyard there, and he realized that that was not, that wasn't the way for me. That's not the way, you know, but he learned brick masonry, working on the brickyard. All right. So he ended up moving. He came to Raleigh, um, and at Raleigh, he worked at Shaw University. He helped build Shaw University. All right. Then he said, okay, this is not cutting it. I'm tired of dealing with bricks. So he went into a barbershop and learned how to, he was a boot black. You know, he literally shined shoes all day, polished and shined shoes all day. But while he was in there, 
He took advantage of his positioning. He took advantage and learned the trade of barbering, almost like, you know, a silent apprentice. This is what you have to do if you black, Hispanic, or Native Indian in this empire, because this empire will fall, okay? It's destined, it's prophesied to fall according to the Bible. You should be paying attention on your slaveries, all right? Learning the ins and outs of how these businesses work, okay? So that whenever it does fall, we can go into business for ourselves. We know how things work. We can go in and, and, and everything will operate smoothly, but better because we have the law, statutes, and commandments, all right? Um, but this brother here, so there's three components that I feel um, were detrimental to Black Wall Street's existence. And one is started with Christianity. A lot of them had real strong ties to the Christian church, all right? Uh, the second thing was um, Freemasonry, all right? Freemasonry from what, uh, what's that dude's name? Good night, 33rd, 33rd degree Mason, Albert Pike. He talked about Freemasonry um, and it's uh, and it being about Luciferianism, okay? It's Satanism, okay? And that's in his book, Morals and Dogma, all right? Um, that's just a sidebar. But I noticed it was because of our, our, our attachment to the Christian church, us falling off in the Freemasonry, and then us, um, in addition to Freemasonry, we want to throw in a Greek letter organizations, black Greek letter fraternities and sororities. They played a very, very major uh, role in the communities of Haiti, you know, at NC Central. In, in one of these books, I have a couple books over here I want to show y'all. All right. The first book is Upbuilding Black Durham. I don't know if y'all can see that. Um, but it's by Leslie Brown. And it says, Gender Class and Black Community Development in the Jim Crow South. It goes in depth with respect to, you know, the key players and Black Wall Street as a whole and what happened here in Durham, which was very, very special. All right. And then I have another book. It's called Durham's Haiti. It's according to the Black America Cities uh, series by Andre D. Van and Beverly Washington Jones. Um, but John Merrick, you know, he took learning those skills in that barbershop, became a barber. This brother became a barber and started making money and started saving his money. How many of us have a savings? Yeah, this brother was wise. The money that he made from being a boot black from being a brick mason, from being a barber, he saved it. And what he did with that money is he invested it. Now, I'm not big on investing, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but it worked for this brother. Um, let me see. Yeah, and with his investment, he went into uh, business with Washington Duke, which is the oppressor um, that Duke University is, is pretty much named after. He and his sons, he was a, a tobacco magnate. He was a white venture capitalist, okay? So it was all about um, making money for him. And they say he, don't, he didn't own slaves. They try to clean it up because they'd have to change the name of Duke University. But I know for a fact he owned slaves because who the hell else you think worked his land? Who do you think harvested all of his tobacco? Inside of the factories, okay? So we had agricultural slavery and then we had industrial. They're working in the factory. And believe it or not, black women, that was a job that you were able to have early on, okay? One of the few jobs outside of domestic uh, labor, being mammy, working, you know, we, everybody seemed to help, right? Um, though that role was commonplace to uh, the black woman. But here in Durham, uh, the tobacco factories would allow black women to work. But it wasn't a good thing because oftentimes you would just be working for free, okay? Um, but anyhow, John Merrick, he is basically uh, responsible for founding North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. So what he did, he revolutionized, um, we'll just say, uh, when it comes down to black insurance, how many people have ever had to bury a relative and not have the funds to do it? I mean, everybody in here, you know what I'm saying? You having, having a fish fry or having to set up a GoFundMe so that you could bury Lil Ray Ray or bury Big Mama. 
right? This brother, what he did, he saw uh, a necessity, you know, with respect to us not being able to bury our loved ones in a, in a, in a dignified manner, all right? So him and his association with the Royal Knights of King David, what they did was they went and they sold insurance premiums, 10 cents a week, all right? If you were a member of the Royal Knights of King David, you have first dibs to these policies, all right? But beyond that, they opened it up. It wasn't just to those affiliated with this Freemason um, organization. Um, and he had thousands of workers, you know, as the story progresses, we'll, we'll talk about that. But they sold 10 cent policies a week. And what's interesting is when they had to, to pay out, when someone died, it was $100. That's what it cost to bury someone way back when, in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. What do you think it costs today? Yeah, it's expensive, right? And nobody has that money just laying around. Um, most of us are working or living paycheck to paycheck, unfortunately, all right? Um, but this brother, <clears throat> he saw a need and he invested in it. And seven other brothers went in, him and, and six other brothers went in a $50 investment and they created a North Carolina mutual life insurance company, all right? And that was, it, it actually became the largest black business in the United States, all right? And it's still around today. Um, next slide. Oh, Dr. A.M. Moore, okay? Another big head Negro. Um, Really, really intelligent, this brother here. Uh, he was the very first medical, the black medical doctor of Durham, and he founded Lincoln Hospital, which is so interesting. If you have an opportunity, Google Lincoln Hospital in Durham, North Carolina, and you'll see, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about that later on, uh, but we didn't have a hospital to go to. You had to go to the barbershop if you needed stitches, or if you needed, you know, to see a dentist. It's usually in the barbershop, right? Or uh, if, you, if a wife's having a baby, they send a midwife to your crib. It wasn't like you're going to the emergency room. We were not allowed to go into like Watts Hospital or whatever. All right. Um, but he, along with John Merrick um, and uh, the other five, uh, they founded the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. All right. Um, yeah. And this brother here, what I like about him, uh, as you learn, if, you, if you, you Google him, you'll learn that he was selfless. He had the spirit of um, just sacrificing, you know. He sacrificed so much. He had property. He didn't hoard his resources to himself, which is what we see oftentimes in our communities during contemporary times. All of our black athletes and entertainers, they hoard resources to themselves, okay, but they never really pour back into the community. Maybe one or two. You know, you coming home doing a damn football camp is not enough, all right? The money that you're making, those millions and millions of dollars, you can actually change the economy of, you know, the, the hood that you grew up in, the projects that you grew up in, the barrio that you came from, the favela that you came from, all right? You could actually change the economy of these places overnight, okay? But we're not strategic. We just want to, you know, uh, envy our oppressor, all right? And that's, that's problematic. All right, uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, I like this brother here, too. C.C. Spaulding. He was the brainchild, literally. This brother has a very interesting background. He kind of bounced around like I did, uh, not knowing his position, but he had a real knack for a management, all right? And he worked inside of one of the grocery stores. Believe it or not, that was very common for us to have grocery stores and general stores where we would sell commodities you know, to each other, um, before Walmart, before Harris Teeter, before Wegmans, all right? We had little moms and pops grocery stores. This brother invested. He took $300 of his own money and invested in one of the grocery stores that he was in the grocery store he was working in, but the grocery store failed, okay? So he was, he was out. His uncle, the slide before, A.M. Moore or whatever, he went and lived with his uncle, all right? He also invested the $50 in with the other six, John Merrick, um, A.M. Moore, um, and the rest of those brothers. 
And he ended up managing North Carolina Mutual. And what he did, he revolutionized uh, just the insurance business, man. And uh, I don't want to get into the, the particulars, but Google him. All right. He's a very, very interesting individual. Uh, he, and it says he achieved national prominence, earned national business awards, and joined President Herbert Hoover's Federal Relief Committee. All right. Go to the next slide. All right, this is uh, <laughs> Dr. James E. Shepard. Is that, they teach all about him in Central Iraq, Officer Iraq. <laughs> this dude here, um, he is the son of a reverend. He's got, they got a picture of him in this book. I know that that brother didn't play the radio. He looked like, you know, he looked worse than the, uh, Steven off Django. You know what I'm saying? And I know he, he preached fire and brimstone in his churches. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't say nothing about white Jesus to his father, okay? And his mother, too. They were, they were both in the church. He has a brother. They are highly educated, all right? But this brother, he founded NC Central, all right? Uh, very, very sharp brother. He was the president of North Carolina T uh, Colored Teachers Association. Um, you could just read his accolades. They go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, but this is another brother that invested in this community. We have to do that, all right? We got to stop being so selfish. We have to stop being so self-absorbed and self-involved, which is what American society turns you into, okay? You come, in the, you come into the ISGPK and you learn the central tenets of brotherhood. Brotherhood is synonymous with sisterhood. This is how we're going to advance our nation, all right? Um, next slide. Baba Kusha. Now, these brothers was getting to the bag. You hear me? Imagine coming off of the plantation, and then you can build a home like this in Durham. That first brother, John Merrick, I was telling you about, this is his house. He's standing on the balcony of his house like, look at what I did. And then just imagine the poor whites to see that. How do you think they felt about that? How do you think they felt about that? I, 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 I'm I proud of this picture here, Salakia. But, you know, it's neither here nor there. You know what I'm saying? Um, next slide. You see the horse in the carriage over here? This here is Dr. Aram, one of his homes. He had multiple properties, you know, properties that he actually donated to uh, NC Central, you know, so that they could, well, to, to Lincoln Hospital, Salakia, so that they could establish a nursing school there. All right? Uh, it's a mansion, man. Just imagine living in a house that size. You, when you go to Stagville Plantation, you'll see they house 10 families in one slave quarter, all right? Two floors. Imagine who could live here. That's why I could see C.C. Spaulding living here. He had his own separate wing of the house. The, he probably got a mother-in-law suite, you know? But this is, this is what we, we could build for ourselves, all right? This is what we created for ourselves, all right? Next slide, Baba Kusha. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you a trip. All right. <laughs> Here is Washington Duke and James Buck Duke and Benjamin Duke, all right? These are the three bastards that really get credit for uh, North Carolina Mutuals and m and um, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, all right? They were what you would call angel investors. They were in with John Merrick because John Merrick used to cut their hair. You know what I'm saying? John Merrick owned, they say six barbershops, but I read different accounts where he owned nine, three of which he allowed black people to patronize. But the other six were for white patrons, all right? We're talking about segregation, all right? Um, but he got in good with the Duke family. And they, you know, they showed him love. He got crumbs from, their, from the master's table, literally, all right? <clears throat> but these bastards, they still were staunch uh, right-wing white supremacists, you know? Um, and they could really give a damn about, you know, black people um, really thriving. They just felt like it was a problem that needed to be addressed, and they didn't want them coming into, you know, the white neighborhoods, all right? So they were, they were about segregation, all right? They're loyal to the Confederacy, all right? Next, next slide. 
All right, so Lincoln Hospital. Yeah, that's the reason why I had the ambassadors before this slide here, because they were the primary uh, funders of Lincoln Hospital, all right? In addition to the monies that the brothers that um, established uh, Mechanics and Farmers um, Bank and uh, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, <coughs> with, the, with, the, with, with their money, they were able to go in to build Lincoln Hospital because black people couldn't go to Watts Hospital, all right? And I wanted to read something with respect to the cornerstone of Lincoln Hospital. Where did I put it? Oh, uh, let's see. This is what Washington Duke, a uh, conversation that he had with one of his uh, colleagues, you know. And it says, uh, this was inscribed in the cornerstone of Lincoln Hospital, which read, with grateful appreciation and loving remembrance of the fidelity and faithfulness of the Negro slaves to the mothers and daughters of the Confederacy during the Civil War. This institution was founded by one of the fathers and sons, B.N. Duke, J.B. Duke, and Washington Duke. Not one act of disloyalty was recorded against them. So it was looked at like it was frowned upon that they would even invest in you know, a black enterprise like Lincoln Hospital, okay? The other uh, social elite, elites uh, looked down upon their investment, and it was a mere meager, meager investment, okay? And they had to write that on the cornerstone of Lincoln Hospital. It was a slight. It was just like, you know, we're doing this, but we still um, hold true to our Southern values. The South will rise again, all right? I'm sure they probably flew Confederate flags on their land. Uh, but yeah, Lincoln Hospital is a very, uh, has a very rich history. I want to talk about Lincoln Hospital a little bit here. Some of the facts and figures. I know General Mahiman uh, was talking about uh, the statistics of um, infant mortality and, and sisters dying during pregnancy, you know. Uh, but Lincoln Hospital, we got some facts and figures about that. All right. And this is from uh, Upbuilding Black Durham, all right? And it says, but Lincoln Hospital was also a striking example of what the black community could accomplish. Women's organizations raised desperately needed money, supplies, and equipment, and volunteers donated energy and time um, that the payroll could not buy. Visiting and reading the patients, providing holiday food and cheer, and hosting visitors, African Americans manifest, manifested race pride through their control of and attention to the institution. So this right here was a beacon of, of hope. This right here was a beacon of, of black pride here. Seeing this hospital for Negroes, built by Negroes, all right? There's a pillar in the community, all right? Um, and it stabilized our community as far as any health disparities. When we couldn't go to our white counterparts, we couldn't go to their side of town seeking medical aid. You could get the same care, if not better. You would get absolute better care at Lincoln Hospital, all right? And you think about, you know, wh whatever your hospital system is, I don't want to go to Kafer Valley. I wish we had a, a black owned and operated hospital in Fayetteville, North Carolina. You know, brother don't want to get sick. You know what I'm saying? Because you're just going to be relegated to, you know, uh, modern medicine. And there's a book called Medical Apartheid. You should look it up. It talks about J. Marion Sims and just the mistrust that we have for modern medicine and all the, 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 the criminal, you know, the atrocities that have befallen us because we have to go to our oppressor for every damn thing. All right. And that's a problem. Um, All right, so getting back to Dr. Moore. It says, until his death in 1923, Aaron Moore served as Lincoln's superintendent without compensation. He didn't even collect a check. That's a very selfless sacrifice. That's the type of sacrifices that we do. You know, we're not going out. Every Saturday, we go on to camp. You know, during the week, instead of me picking up a second job, I'm teaching class. I'm holding Shamar. 
all right, making those selfless sacrifices for the sake of raising up other brothers and sisters so they can learn this truth. They can learn the value of brotherhood. They can learn the value of sisterhood, man. That's what this is about, all right? Um, it says, Aaron Moore served as Lincoln superintendent without compensation. He also bequeathed three of his rental properties to the Lincoln Hospital Nursing School with rent from these houses paying for worthy girls who are desirous of taking nursing training. So he established one of the first nursing schools here in North Carolina for black women, all right? Uh, Moore's gesture made it possible for poor women to pursue professional careers and for ordinary people to be their supporters. Um, it says the hospital clearly served multiple purposes in accordance with its place as part of the segregated racial structure necessitated by a Jim Crow society. Before the operating of the new building, it provided the only emergency care, surgery, lab tests, and other medical services available to Durham's black folk. Over the years, it added wards, including one for disabled children. As a black control facility, the hospital served as a base from which health initiatives were launched and represented increased professional opportunities for black men and women. You go over to Shaw's Leonard, Leonard School of Medicine and you become a doctor. And then you go try to shop your resume around. You're trying to get you know, hired. You can't go to Watts. They're not hiring uh, at, at the major other at the, at the major white hospitals, you had to go to Lincoln. You had to, all right? Now, granted, you're not going to make the salary that a so-called white physician would make, but just think about it. You're serving your people. Isn't that the reason why you went to med school? Isn't that the reason why you went into medicine or into nursing? It's because you had a, 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 a keen uh, attention to wanting to help other people, all right? And we need to have that same spirit. Every, everyone should have that spirit, um, whatever your vocation is. It says, collaborating with the mutual, the hospital supported the annual Negro Health Week using nurses, teachers, and students in a series of educational programs, clinics, and parables that disseminated information, provided health care, and generated race pride. There's nothing wrong with you being prideful of being an Israelite, all right? There should be no shame in that. Psalms 83 talks about the other nations being confederate against us, bringing the name of Israel to no more remembrance. We have to remember, man, the Lord calls us to be a very reflective people, all right? We got to remember the days of old, right? That's what we're doing right here with this lecture. Anyhow, um, I just thought it was really interesting. These are some of the statistics about Lincoln Hospital and the value that it brought to the community of Haiti. okay? The 20th century health movement improved life expectancy among Southern African Americans from an average of 36 years in 1910 to 41.4 years in 1920 and 47.5 years by 1930. We weren't living to see 36. You talk about health disparity. This is very important. If you black and speck and native Indian, go to the doctor, okay? Something ain't right, go get checked out, all right? Anyhow, it says the death rate showed a similar pattern, dropping from 26.1 to 22.3 per thousand in the 20s. The death rate among African Americans in Durham similarly improved, dropping from 29.9 to 22.4 per thousand during the same decade, all right? Significantly, Lincoln's focus on women and children's health through prenatal guidance, mother's classes, nutrition programs, well baby clinics and midwives training, all led by nurses, dramatically decreased deaths among women and their infants. <clears throat> Durham County reported that black infant mortality at over 400 deaths per thousand live births in 1910 fell to 196 per thousand by 1923 and to 173.5 per thousand by 1924. In the end, individual and organized efforts between doctors, nurses, teachers, and students, club women and volunteers, and white donors, and black administrators combined to ameliorate, ameliorate health problems and mortality among Durham's black population, especially among women and children. 
All right, you can go to the next slide. Lock in. This is uh, one of the properties that A.M. Moore, Dr. A.M. Moore, donated to Lincoln Hospital. This is Stokes Nursing Home Annex, all right? So if you want to go into the vocation of a nurse, which is what most of our sisters do, they want to go to nursing school, right? At that point in time, in the early 1900s, that's where you would have to go. You have to come to Durham and sign up, you know what I'm saying, to lock it. Next slide. All right, so I didn't know this before, you know, once we got off the plantation, couldn't afford to go to a regular mortician. <clears throat> so out of necessity, we had to come up with our own funeral home. We had to become morticians, okay? We had to learn how to embalm bodies. We had to learn the whole process, you know, of, of, of you know, whatever a funeral home it consists of, all right? Because you couldn't go up, up, you couldn't go up, up to Jernigan Warren or wherever, you know. And it's funny because I'm from Fayetteville, and on on, on Murkison, Murkison Road, how many funeral homes do they have over there off of Zion? Good night. They got a lot. What's the one uh, everybody go to? Wiseman, right? You know, you from Fayetteville too? Most High in Christ. We in the building, uh, but Wiseman Mortuary Services. It's a, it's a few of them on Murkison Road. This is how we establish ourselves financially, economically, in our own neighborhoods, all right? Combating red zone. Who cares about redlining? Just be happy that you're there with your people, all right? And it's, it's a very beautiful thing because we are a nation that's not desired, right? Keep reading. I mean, next slide, Salakia. <laughs> this is the triumvirate, okay? And we talked about this uh, yeah, I'm going to pull this one up, pull this one here. I got notes everywhere. We got Merrick. We got Spalding. We got Moore, all right? And that term, triumvirate, is really, really interesting. Anybody know what that means? Nobody knows what it means. All right. So when you think about us envying our oppressor, all right, a triumvirate literally is... I'm not getting into numerology, but they say there's power in, in threes. Like they say, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost in the church, right? Well, I learned that the so-called oppressor only respects money, blood, and education, okay? And when it comes down to these brothers, you had the, 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 the investor. You had the brains of, of managing, okay? And you had the brother with uh, a real specific vocation. He was a physician. He was highly intelligent and he knew the value of sacrificing. And all three of these brothers right here was what you, what you would call the triumvirate. And who can give me the definition of that? Let me pull it up. We talk about the triumvirate. It is a very ancient Roman and, and Greek uh, a word. Good night. You got it? Go ahead and read it, Baba Kusha. Right. A group of three men holding power. They held power in, in Durham. They held power in the Haiti community. They held power on Black Wall Street, right? Keep reading. Right. So these brothers kind of mirrored those three devils, Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, right? This is what, you know, they have been relocated to, you know, but it is what it is, man. If we black, Hispanic, and Native Indian, we can't model or fashion ourselves after our white counterparts, all right? We're not going to win that way. We have our own separate, uh, I guess, history. We have our own separate heritage. We got our own separate customs and traditions. And another, uh, one of the third tenets as to why Black Wall Street fell was because we embraced the oppressor's um, holidays. You know, all throughout this book, I see pictures of birthday parties and, you know, uh, them celebrating the 4th of July. And this is ridiculous, man. Next slide, Baba Kusha. These are uh, the seven brothers that invested um, in North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, which was 
um, the precursor to uh, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, all right? These, both of these businesses are still around to this day. 100-year-old Black-owned businesses, okay? This was the foundation of the economy of Black Wall Street here in Durham, North Carolina, all right? And because these businesses were so successful, they spawned other businesses, other business ventures. The, the fastest way for you to gain any wealth here in America is through home ownership and business ventures, all right? Next slide. Okay, and now you, you see North Carolina Mutual Life uh, Insurance Building here. <coughs> the North Carolina Mutual Provident Association, all right? The largest Negro insurance company in the world. You know, this is our history, all right? Next slide. And you see more of the buildings, okay? Um, next slide. This brother here, he stood out to me, all right? And I think about us being amongst our own in our own communities, all right? This brother here, you know what he's doing? He's selling flowers. He's selling flowers to the farmers and the mechanics that are going, putting the down payments on their houses, paying on, paying on the loans for the small businesses, okay? He's catching them when they come out of the building, and he's hustling. He's selling flowers, all right? This is the spirit that we should have. But just think, he's out here by himself, a child. So our communities were safe, all right? Because we were separated, because we were segregated from the devil that the Bible speaks of, okay? Next slide, man. Okay, so these are the employees that are working in North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance. The black woman, again, you all had your own floor, not just in the insurance company, but in the bank. And you held it down. You were responsible for the success of these businesses. All right. There was absolute value in, 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 in our women. Your brothers got to acknowledge that. You got to uh, respect that. You know, we know that the black man is the prize in the school. Okay. But our sisters, they was holding it down, man. All right. Next slide. All right. This is North Carolina Mutual Life uh, Insurance build, uh, Building. And you can see all the investors there. Uh, next slide. All right. So we talked about the ties to Freemasonry. This right here is the uh, what is it, the Royal Kings or the Royal Knights of whatever. Uh, through the brotherhood of this organization, they established themselves um, financially in Durham, all right? Uh, but you see us here working in the cotton mills and the textile mills. That job, uh, specifically in Durham, was um, relegated to, to, to white people. They didn't allow us to really uh, work in the textile mills. They put us in the more grueling tobacco, uh, tobacco uh, factories, all right? And you see these sisters here. What does it, it look like they're doing there? They're working in the mills. They're, they're knitting socks right now, all right? Uh, next slide. All right. So we talk about the Shazors. Uh, Thabo Wan uh, came up and found this, found this image here. And these sisters is in cosmetology school, all right? Well, most of our sisters go to cosmetology school today. How far are we, remo are we removed from the Reconstruction period? We haven't really truly advanced, you know? But this worked for us, all right? Where do you think they got that hair from? That hair didn't come from India, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, we wasn't, we wasn't outsourcing, you know what I'm saying? Imagine how successful you, you, you would be in a classroom with other black students, your peers, your brothers and sisters, and you're learning from a black instructor who wants the absolute best for you. Imagine you going to school now and the teachers hate you. They hate your children, they hate our children. You know, and you read the report cards and it's like, well, the, the grade says 76, but he's a joy, he's a desire, to, a joy to have in the classroom, you know? Because you're not, it's not helping. It's not beneficial uh, for us to be joined to the other nations, all right? We got to get back to this, all right? Next one, next slide. 
All right, this is Hillside Park High School. We talk about us having our own businesses, us having our own communities. Started with us having our own schools, all right? Education starts at home. There was a, you don't have to worry about Hillside getting shot up by a mass shooter. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, what was the first one? I remember Columbine, I remember that. Trench coat mafia, that wouldn't happen here. The damn trench coat mafia would not happen here. What's the other one? Um, Sandy Hook, that would not happen here. It happened in Hillside because we were separated from the devil that the Bible speaks of. It's, it makes sense, it makes sense. We weren't having to deal with uh, the crime <coughs> that we deal with today, you know? Next slide, Bob Kushaw. Good night. All right. We got to get back to this, you know? And I'm not being dismissive of our sisters putting the so-called oppressor on the moon. All right. But these vocational skills, it's home ec. They learning how to bake cakes right here. Look at that. How many sisters you know can, can, can bake a cake? Most? I give that sister a hand. Oh, Lord, I know that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait to try one, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and, and these sisters right here, what are they doing? They sewing. These sisters are sewing. That's a real skill, learning how to be a seamstress. Can you imagine? Think about the, 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 the people that, uh, the brothers and sisters that make garments. They make making bank. The vendors at the Passover, I know I'm buying a garment this year. I pray Captain Kaposh got he coming with that heat this year, Lord willing. Him and uh Captain Yagarwa, they 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 had to they had to learn how to do this. All right. Next slide. So lock in. All right, this is the green book. <clears throat> they had a, a movie that was I didn't care for the movie <clears throat> because the, the main character was ah, Thabawan, help me here. Oh, he was gay. Okay, that's the safe term. Yeah, I didn't like this movie because they really dismissed the greatness of this Green Book and amplified this character being gay, all right, which is what they do. They weaponize entertainment against us, being Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians living in the empire, okay? But the Green Book basically was a resource for our people traveling through the South, Traveling through the, the deep south, the Jim Crow South, all right? We could go wherever. You need to go to Asheville. Who been to Asheville before? Up in the mountains. You, you can find lodging in Asheville. Restaurants, beauty parlors. You can get a haircut in Asheville. And you from Fayetteville. You don't know no other Negroes. We had to depend on each other. We got to get back to that, all right? Who's going to come up with the green book in the UPK? Who's coming up with the, the, with, with the, with the green book? We got brothers in every, in every city. In every zone, there's brothers in this room that have multiple skill sets, sisters in this room that have tremendous talent. You know, somebody just needs to do the work, compile it, and then we have another green book, getting back to Black Wall Street, right? Next slide, Baba Kusha. Oh, okay, yeah, we had lodging. We had our own hotels. Imagine that, the Biltmore Hotel. There's two, two separate um, lodging establishments. You know, we will still be competing with the embassy suites or with uh, the Hampton Inn or whatever, the La Quinta, right? Imagine us going to the Passover and us investing our money in a black owned hotel. We could buy out the Biltmore. Imagine us buying out the damn Biltmore in 2023. We got to get back to that. Next slide, Baba Kusha. Yeah, another hotel, Jones Hotel. Next slide. Next slide. Say it's now a parking lot. You know, and I hate for you all to be um, disappointed when you come, uh, when you converge on Raleigh to, to do the Black Wall Street tour. A lot of these sites, a lot of these buildings, they don't exist anymore. We had our own movie theaters. You didn't have to sit in the damn overflow or come in through the back building, or the, back of the, the back of the building. You didn't have to wait until all the white, you know, uh, customers bought their concessions before you could purchase yours. Next slide. 
Uh, yeah, it's more of the green book. You, you can slide next next slide. Is this slide going? Is this slideshow going to be made available? Yeah, uh, get with your camp leader. The slide the slideshow will be made available to you. If you need con contextual notes, you know we'll get with you. This right here is just the precursor to um, a bigger um, project. But Booker T. Washington, uh, he visits Durham. Negro Wall Street in 1910, all right? This is somebody they prop up that we should be like, according to our oppressor, all right? But what I read about Booker T. Washington, you know, he said, I never saw a city of this size, so many prosperous carpenters, brick masons, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, cotton mill operators, and tobacco factory workers among the Negroes. But beyond that, we were owning businesses. We own that Biltmore. We own the Regal Theater. We had a damn donut shop here, man. We had our own um, beauty supply stores. You didn't have to go to Sally or go to uh, Moab or Ammon. Okay? Next slide, Baba Kusha. W.E.B. Dubois, a big-headed Negro, all right? The upbuilding of Black Durham, all right? He praised Durham just based off of what he saw happening here. Now, just both of these brothers are well-traveled. Wherever they went in America, they're, 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 they're like political scientists. They're taking in, you know, what they see, and they're making observations, okay? And they wrote dissertations about Durham and uh, Jackson Ward and, 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 and Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? This brother said he describes a bevy of Black-owned businesses, including grocery stores, barbershops, drug stores, a bank, a shoe store, a haberdashery, and an undertaking establishment, uh, as well as factories that produce mattresses, hosiery, like those sisters that were making those socks, bricks, iron, articles, and dressed lumber. Okay? It's really, really interesting. They also talked about <clears throat> how um, accepting the climate was here of the so-called white people with respect to the blacks in Durham. Okay. Out of sight, out of mind. Next slide. Oh, Lord. Here we go. Martin Luther the King. He visits White Rock Baptist Church in Hay in Hayti um, in 1960. All right. Um, Papa Juan, you talked about this. He was actually supposed to meet at a church here when he got killed in Memphis, Tennessee. He was supposed to meet in Durham. You know, he should have made that decision. He'd probably still be allowed to, well, yeah, ain't no telling. We ain't no telling. We ain't going to say that. Uh, but the next slide, man, it's a lot. <laughs> okay. And so Durham actually was a precursor to the Woolworth sit-ins that occurred with the Greensboro Four, okay? Um, that actually happened here in Durham, all right? Us trying to force ourselves on the oppressor. Us trying to force ourselves for them to, to serve us ice cream milkshakes that you know they spat in, cheeseburgers that you know they kicked across the kitchen floor, you know? Like, what, what are we doing? That's insanity. We've been trying and striving for millennia to be at one with these people, okay? But here in Durham, it, it worked until this, all right? The Civil Rights Movement, right? Next slide. It's a lock in. Urban renewal, all right. How many people have ever heard of urban renewal? Or as James Baldwin coined, Negro removal. That's all it is, it's, it's code, okay? It's a dog whistle term for, you know, uh, it's about us, it ain't about you, all right? This is according to Britannica. Urban renewal, a comprehensive scheme to redress a complex of urban problems, including unsanitary, deficient, or obsolete housing. James Merrick, shout out to him because he would get tips from Washington Duke when they were going to demolish, you know, a, a structure downtown on the white side of town. And Washington Duke would allow James Merrick to establish a crew to go and get the lumber from, from, from the sites that were being demolished. What do you think they did with that lumber? They brought it back to Haiti and they built homes. They built businesses, okay, with the scraps from the oppressor, all right? Uh, 
This, is, this made it easy for urban renewal to actually occur or transpire in, 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 in Haiti, okay? Uh, transportation, sanitation, and other services and facilities, haphazard land use, traffic congestion, and the sociological uh, correlates of urban decay, such as crime, all right? And they're withholding resources from you. What do you think's going to happen? You're willing to go get a job, but they tell you what? No, we're the, we the last hired in the first fire, right? So they make it, they, they, they create um, a setting for us to resort to crime. But the beautiful thing about this school is we know that we can't be criminals in here. We can't be criminals in here and the Lord be with us, man. All right? Yeah. Uh, next slide. Oh, we got like a hundred. All right. Most high in Christ. Uh, urban renewal. Next slide. <clears throat> that red line is uh, the 147 of the Durham Highway, okay? You see this topographical map here of Durham, all right? And it's going, cutting straight through Haiti, all right? And as you can see, you, you, you see Fayetteville Street, you see Pettigrew Street, you know, and these, these, this is where Black Wall Street was, was situated. The bulk of our businesses were in this four block radius here, okay? But because of urban renewal, okay, the city council uh, deeming that it would be more appropriate to do away with that side of town. And we need the 147, so it would be an easier, a thoroughfare for us to get back and forth to work, to go to the suburbs, okay? This is what happened, all right? 1950, 1972, okay? Is that 22 years? Next slide. All right, this is the Shazors. Remember those sisters, the, all the, that room full of all them beautiful sisters that were in there, and they were learning how to do hair? You see the, uh, the busts of, um, with the weave and all that? That's the building that they were once in. What happened to it? They demolished it, man, for the sake of urban renewal. That's in 1968. Next slide. It's <coughs> a lock here. This is the former site of the Jones Hotel. We showed you that picture. Now, what is it? Looks like a, a damn parking lot. Next slide. The former site of uh, the Durham Knitting Mill and the Royal Knights of King David. It's not there. What it looks like, what is that, a warehouse? The back of some, uh, come on, man. Next slide. Now, this is sad because Lincoln Hospital was a pillar in this community. It was literally one of the, the, the backbone of resources to uplift our people, all right? It was a, a beacon of, of hope for, you know, the black people living in this Haiti community. What happened? They, didn't, they, they demolished it, all right? It's a, it's a shame. Next slide. Okay, Most High Christ. And, and with that, I'm going to bring up Officer Dabawan. The water, get, give my brother Officer of a Thousand Bunk here all a hand. The water. Excellent, excellent work. Um, so I got a little, we're going we're gonna to kind of breeze through it. Um, what we just saw, this presentation, you know, we're going to wrap it up. Let me get that, that, that next slide real quick. Actually, just there's one slide and another one. Yeah, you can skip that one, right? It was a video. You can skip that one, right? So this is a picture of um, Harlem, New York. This is Harlem, New York, right? During the Great Migration. You see this sign here that says, the new Negro has no fear, okay? So uh, this Great Migration of Negroes uh, from the south uh, to the north, all right, let me, let me just get my notes here, so lock here. Um, be quick. It was as if the smoke from uh, the charred remains of Gr Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma had barely dissipated as scores of Negroes disillusioned with the treatment in the South by white terrorists made their way to the North, where people like Mr. Alan Locke said was the nucleus of the Negro Revolution. You see what they're saying? The new Negro has no fear, right? The Great Migration, as it called, was, was, as it was called, was quite symmetrical. We won't get into too much, but you know, if you look at a map, you know, most of us, like if you're from somewhere else, so again, you know, me and Yanis are from New York, right? Um, you got brothers from Chicago, Detroit, brothers from California. Almost all of our grandparents are from the South in some way, shape, or form. If you're from New York, 
nine times out of ten, your grandparents are either from North Carolina, South Carolina, or maybe Georgia. If you're from Chicago, your grandmother's from Mississippi or Alabama or some part of the eastern part of Texas. If you're from California, your grandmother is without a doubt from Mississippi, Alabama, or some other part of Texas. Okay? St. St. Louis, right? Same thing. Okay? So, Salakia, bear with me. So, um, as we discuss, uh, these lands, or these places that they went, it definitely afforded uh, black folks a lifestyle that they had only dreamed of previously. I mean, look at this. I mean, look at the architecture. Look at this, the tall, the tall buildings. You couldn't see something like this in, in Durham, even if you wanted to, right? So it was like a dream for them, but there was um, it wasn't quite the dream that they expected. You know what I mean? Um, even though it was a movement and a vibrancy that was unmatched, I mean, you're living down the block from Joe Lewis, right? Or you're in California or in Chicago and you're living near all these celebrities and it's just this, you know, Hollywood lifestyle, right? But I hope you see where I'm going with this. Uh, the dream of our betterment that so, that, that so many of our grandparents left the South to find in the North, truth be told, it just eluded them. Uh, some of us prospered, but that's the problem. Some of us prospered. The circumstances that forced us to create Tulsa and Haytai and Jackson Ward didn't quite exist in the North. To put it plain, there were varying degrees of upward mobility for Negroes in the North but specifically the kind that divided us. As we discussed earlier, it just wasn't enough room for us all, and everybody could not eat. Whereas John Merrick and A.M. Moore and C.C. Spaulding established themselves in business mostly for the benefit of the people of Haiti in service to the community. But this was just not as easy in these other cities, where the infrastructure had been established much earlier and where fresh off the boat immigrants from Europe and other places were given better opportunities than we were, than blacks, Hispanics, and native Indians. The communal spirit of selflessness was all but crushed over time. And while we see highlights of the spirit of black Wall Street in spurts throughout the great migration, even in those spurts, we begin to see the degradation of things. Next slide, please. I mean, look, we had the entrepreneurial spirit that, that traveled from the South to Chicago, right? What about the, uh, the BET's founder and the first black billionaire, Robert Louis Johnson, who was born in Hickory, Mississippi? What about the founder of Ebony and Jet Magazine, John Johnson, born in Arkansas City, Arkansas? Everyone knows Madam C.J. Walker. She was from Delta, Louisiana. And what about John Wally Amos? I remember famous Amos Cookies? Yeah. Well, he was from Tallahassee, Florida, before he moved to New York City, right? There's always a left-hand side to things, and that's the unfortunate part. What was a good thing in the South, um, that mindset, as we went to these cities, you know, whoever listened to the song by Stevie Wonder, Living for the City? You know, the part in the middle where he's, you know, uh, skyscrapers and everything, right? And he goes to the city, and then the dude says, you hold this for me, or whatever, and then he goes to jail. Sorry if I spoiled it for you. But those kind of things, you know, that, 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 that kind of thing was taking place. Next slide, please. On the left-hand side. The spirit of entrepreneurship didn't always go with legality. All of these men, see some of the most famous underworld bosses in the history of America, right? Guess what, all of them made tons of money in New York and Philadelphia, right? But Bumpy Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson was from Charleston, South Carolina. Frank Lucas was from North Carolina. A little bit later on, you know what I mean? You got Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols, right? He was from, um, not North Carolina, he's from Birmingham, Alabama. And then of course, how could we forget Black Caesar himself, Durham's own Frank Matthews, who they have not found to this day. He was from Durham, North Carolina and made tons of money illegally in Philadelphia and New York, right? And this is on the left-hand side of the, the criminality part. It gets, there's other, terrible things that took place that actually originated in the South and carried themselves to these major cities. Next slide, please. These characters everybody may not know, but I'll tell you a little something about these guys, right? So lock, let me scroll down. Bear with me, right? Again, there's a left-hand side to things, right? So we got David Barksdale. He's the founder of the Black Disciples. He was from Salus, Mississippi. We have Larry Hoover founder of the Gangster Disciples. He was from Jackson, Mississippi. Remember we talked about the map, Mississippi and everything, right? All the, almost everybody from Chicago, they, they either was born in Mississippi or their parents was born in Mississippi, right? 
Then what about Jeff Fort, right? The co-founder of the Black Peace Stones. He was from Aberdeen, Mississippi. And then how could we forget about Stanley Tookie Williams, right? Founder of the West Side Crips from Shreveport, Louisiana. And the original founder of the entire Crip organization, Raymond Washington, who was not born in California. He was born in Haskell, Texas. Next slide, please. <laughs> and on the, I guess, kind of right-hand side of that, the so-called freedom fighters of our history, right? We can talk about them. Well, guess what? This same spirit of independence that we talked about earlier, that these brothers had a little bit of, they also came from the South, right? Isn't that interesting? The Black Panther movement was born from, from the, these minds of these, uh, these men with Southern roots. Huey P. Newton was originally from Monroe, Louisiana. Bobby Seale was born in Liberty, Texas. H. Rat Brown, the fifth chairman of SNCC, right? He was, uh, 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 he was from Salakia. He was from Texas as well, right? And you got Eldridge Cleaver. He was from Wabasika, Arkansas. And little Bobby Hutton, the first member, the first uh, recruit of the Black Panther Party. He was from Jefferson County, Arkansas. This movement from the south to the north uh, took with it these, these spirits or this spirit in spurts. What was once our dedication to each other, it became what? It became our fight against one another. These men, these Black Panther brothers, you know, uh, uh, um, Eldridge Cleaver ended up hating uh, Huey P. Newton, right? All of that togetherness as we left the, 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 the South and went to these big cities up North, it just completely disappeared, right? And we can even talk about the, uh, the anti-Christianness too, you know, that it is, that um, what they call, whenever you're black and you're not Christian, they, they, they call you call that what? An alternative religion, right? That's what they refer to it as, you know what I mean? But I mean, if you want to talk about people like um, Clarence 13X, the founder of uh, the 5% Nation, you know what I'm saying? Peace God, all of that, right? He was originally from Danville, uh, Virginia. Elijah Muhammad was originally from Georgia. And Noble Drew Ali, you know the cats with the popcorn, you know what I mean? He was also from the South. He was, uh, they say he was either from North Carolina or Virginia. But this movement, not only did it bring with these varying degrees of, of uh, uh, independence from different sectors that we were used to, there was something else that happened at the same time. Next slide, please. You might know who that is? Abba Bivens learned what he learned from men from the South. Same kind of people that we're talking about. Brothers who had been taught by slaves by former slaves about their identity, about the truth according to the Bible and about who they were. And he took that to Philadelphia and then ultimately to New York. And then he taught other brothers the things that he had learned. And when I told you that this uh, lecture was gonna come full circle, this is what I meant. The great migration that began from Stagville going through these black Wall Streets, we attempted to have something of our own, but it failed. Going up to New York and to Philadelphia and Chicago and all of these places, it wasn't completely in vain. The journey did produce something of merit because the spirit of black Wall Street is not dead. Because as we learn, the true black Wall Street has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with what we learn in the ISUPK is what? Brotherhood. Nothing matters without brotherhood. I do not care how rich you are, how poor you are. I've been taught by the men above me, if you're black, Hispanic, or native Indian, I have to love you. I have no choice. Next slide, please. He taught it to more men. He taught it to uh, uh, high priest Ariya. He taught it to Masha. He taught it to Yaikwab, who was Ariya's father. And on down to commanding General Yohanna to us. Next slide, please. So in the end, the spirit of, of, of Black Wall Street, and if we want to get it back, and if we never want to lose it again, we have to do something. And that is we have to dedicate ourselves to each other. We have to be uncompromising in the choice. It's a choice, but it's a choice that the Most High made easy for us. When he said in Zephaniah 2 and 1, gather yourselves together. That's the choice. Now, either you're going to do it or you're not. But guess what? The brothers of the ISUPK, we already made our choice. We're going to love our people. So the beginning, the seeds of Black Wall Street that I promise you is going to grow are starting right here in the ISUPK under Commander General Yohanna. We appreciate you all for coming out. Um, 
it's been an absolute pleasure talking to y'all about, you know what I'm saying, Black Wall Street going into these histories. But, you know, that concludes the uh, presentation for today. So appreciate it. Thank you. You get the light. Y'all boss shit man outside the power. Y'all boss shit man outside the power. The fall we fear. The fall we fear. Yeah, how was son? Yeah, how was son? Yeah, how was son? Israel! 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 Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. So we're gonna get this, uh, get this prepped and everything, and it should be available for viewership sometime by the end of today, if not today, tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. I end the bar. <laughs>